hit the button? We're rolling. Okay, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, we apologize all in advance for any of the technical gremlins that beseech our previous edition of this. Here, we're hoping to do this all in one take, uninterrupted, no, no bowl, no, no nonsense. Anywho, if you need a recap of who we are, I am your, I am the showrunner, Gregory W. Nevin, and with me are co-host Samuel Eiler, Christopher Grahl, Scott Martis, and guest hosts Dylan DeWitt, Cameron Muskell, Dr. Thomas Holtz, expert on all things Tyrannosauridae. Alright, okay, let's get started, let's get back on our first, what was, okay, back to our first question here. <clears throat> All right, the first question that we had asked was about female Tyrannosaurus versus male Tyrannosaurus, size-wise. Wow. So the, um, the gist of the question was, um, um, where did the story, the idea that female Tyrannosaurus being larger than male Tyrannosaurus come from, and what's the current status? So um, the, the main idea of female Tyrannosaurus being the larger one really starts in the early 1990s in the discovery of the specimen Sue. Although it was based on a 1980s idea when people began to notice, thought they noticed at least, dimorphism in some other theropods, uh, in particular things like Coelophysis and Megaphis or Cetarsis as we called it at the time. Um, and there was a thought that some specimens of Tyrannosaurus were more robust, more heavily built than others. Um, and an idea promoted by Pete Larson, um, although not uniquely to him, but he was the main promoter of this, was the idea that the more robust ones were the female ones, um, which have analogies in the modern world. In raptorial birds, the female birds are larger, typically, than male ones. Um, and also the thought that in, in an egg-laying archosaur, uh, more, having the females being more robust uh, might be helpful because during ovulation, they're forming eggs, they're draining nutrients from the skeleton, and if you're more robust to begin with, then you could lose more of your bone and still be a functional animal. So that's sort of the logic behind it. Uh, additionally, there were other ideas like that the pattern and shape of the forwardmost chevrons, these sort of ribs for the tail, technically they're not ribs, but they're sort of like ribs for the tail, um, that the anterior or forwardmost chevrons had a different pattern and different shapes in male and female archosaurs. And the idea was that the penile and retractile muscles um, would, uh, well, since that's around where they attach, you're gonna form different shapes among the chevrons. Only, it turned out when people looked at it statistically, uh, statistical samples of this, that you actually can get both the quote-unquote female and quote-unquote male patterns of chevrons in female and in male alligators. So they're actually not sex-specific patterns. Um, and additionally, the specimen Sue, which was thought to be female, uh, turned out to have the male pattern of chevrons when they actually prepared that part of the tail. Uh, but more importantly, um, the idea of there being two morphs in Tyrannosaurus has never been demonstrated statistically. There definitely are more robust individuals, and there are more gracile individuals, and there's actually intermediate individuals. And it's not at all certain that what we're seeing are two populations, robust and graciles, rather than a continuous distribution of gracile and intermediate and more robust individuals. And the one specimen that we're fairly confident of its sex so-called B-Rex or Bob, um, and where it has inside its femur, it's got this medullary bone tissue. Medullary bone is associated in birds and crocodilians with ovulating, uh, so therefore it's a, a female uh, characteristic. Well, this B-Rex specimen does have this medullary bone, and so almost certainly it's female, but it's, nine, it's at neither end of this size spectrum. It's not a particularly robust individual. It's not a particularly gracile individual. It's a little on the robust side, but really, if we divided it into threes, it's in the intermediate section and not in the gracile or the robust morphs. Um, so the one that they're pretty confident of what sex it is, we can't really say which of the two populations it's from. So it could well be that male Tyrannosaurus were more gracile and female 
were more robust. That's certainly a possibility, but it's not been demonstrated yet. Um, and because of that, right now, we simply don't have good evidence within tyrannosaurids or within most dinosaurs of what the pattern of sexual dimorphism, if any, was. Okay, that's a very good answer. Thank you, sir. Sure. All right. All right, Sam, you want to ask your questions? Uh, yes. Uh, hang on a second. Um, okay. Uh, oh. Okay, here we are. Uh, in your opinion, how do you personally think Tyrannosaurus Rex and Tyrannosaurus in general might have evolved had, had they not gone extinct? Right. So, um, Tyrannosaurids, of course, are among the very last of the non avian dinosaurs. Um, so let's say that the uh, great extinction event had occurred or hadn't been as severe. Um, what could have been the fate of Tyrannosaurids? Well, I don't think they would have gotten much larger, uh, because I think with Tyrannosaurus rex, we're seeing close to the upper size limit of being a terrestrial carnivore. Uh, we see that Tyrannosaurus and Juchen Tyrannus in the Tyrannosaurids reach about that size. We see independently that among the Carcharodontosaurids, the very largest Carcharodontosaurids are about the same size, and the very largest Spinosaurids are about the same size. So. That might be the threshold you could be in above that size, you know, give or take probably a couple tons. You can't really be an effective carnivore anymore. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so size-wise, they probably aren't going to increase. But there's some other changes that might happen. One would be uh, the continued reduction of the forelimbs. Uh, the forelimbs in earlier tyrannosauroids were typically fairly long. The reduction is a relatively late change, um, and although the arms were probably still functional in some contexts, they probably were critical functions, certainly not necessary for prey acquisition. So it's a sort of trait that they could lose, and so you could have armless tyrannosaurs if they continued on much further, or essentially armless, maybe little spikes or something. Um, other possibilities, um, T-Rex itself, the last and most derived tyrannosaurid, uh, at least in terms of the skull, has the most expanded in the back and the most forward-facing eyes. So you might have continued that pattern of increasing the, the back of the skull, so the jaw muscle power, and consequently having more forward-facing eyes. Um, those last two, the, the, redu the reduced arms and this expanded back of the skull with more forward-facing eyes, actually Greg Paul, the artist and scientist, came up with an, that sort of idea with his speculations about late Cenozoic dinosaurs um, that he talked about about 20 years ago or so. Um, you might have had a little bit more reduction in the number of teeth, since Tyrannosaurus also has the smallest tooth count of any of the adult Tyrannosaurids, but I don't think you're going to see that much more reduced, uh, because I don't think you could really be an effective feeder with just a, you know, four big maxillary teeth uh, in a large body carnivore. Um, so, but maybe a, a little bit more reduction, maybe like, you know, nine or eight teeth instead of the, you know, 11 to 13 maxillary teeth OC and T-Rex. So those might be some of the more likely um, changes we might see in Tyrannosaurid history, have they survived? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my uh, next question was, uh, has Tyrannosaurus always been your favorite dinosaur? Yes. Yes, ever since I was uh, a very little kid, uh, in fact, beyond where I have memory, um, Tyrannosaurus has been my favorite dinosaur. It would have been the second, either the first or second dinosaur I learned about, and we can't reconstruct definitely the sequence, whether I got a Tyrannosaurus toy first or a Tyrannosaurus toy, but as one of them was first and the other one was second. Um, and very early on, I decided that I, when I grew up, I was going to be Tyrannosaurus Rex. When I found out that that was not a possibility, I decided I would study them, but I've always uh, had Tyrannosaurus as my favorite dinosaur. In fact, I, early on, I recognized that I had the same initials, same first two initials for Thomas Richard and Tyrannosaurus Rex. So. <laughs> as, as a kid, I always wanted to be Godzilla, since Godzilla was my favorite made-up dinosaur. Well, there you go. I'm sure you pretended to destroy cities when you were a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's 
destroy cities and do battle with other giant monsters. Oh god. Exactly. Yeah. When I was yeah, like... Tyrannosaurus Rex is also my favorite dinosaur, and uh, I always wear Tyrannosaurus Rex all the time, and that's oh, god. basically my go-to dinosaur, so... Yeah, uh, I've got I've got T Rex on my T shirt as well from the current game museum. Oh, ah, good, good. I have uh, Darwin Opterix as my T my T shirt right now. But I was gonna say when I was like six or seven, I always acted like a like a I I didn't specifically act like a T Rex, but kind of just general therapod. I either acted like a Dromaeosaur or a T Rex. It was I even got pictures from me when I was younger. When I'm like uh, doing the yeah. whole pronamed hands thing and I'm like roaring and stuff, it's it's funny. But yeah, my uh, I I'm gonna ask my question next. So uh, of all the research you've done in your career, what do you believe uh, have what do you believe of all the research you've done? Which uh, which of those have had the biggest impact on the subject you were um, working on? Sure, um, I would say um, there's probably a, a combination of sort of three major lines of research. One would have been um, the phylogenetic works and mm -hmm. the establishment of tyrannosaurids as giant salurosaurs and not the sort of super carnosaurs that <clears throat> had um, most of the early, the first couple um, go-rounds in cladistic analyses of theropods were really just focused on the origin of birds. And so non birdiness wasn't something they were interested in. Um, and so I have granted a couple others at the same time, uh, Phil Curry and, and Fernando Novas, um, uh, but I came across, and the mine was the, the more uh, comp most comprehensive of the analyses that show that no, tyrannosaurids were closer to things like ornithomimids and dromaeosaurids and birds than they were to allosaurus or megalosaurus. Um, and so uh, that sort of established the uh, Solurosauria nature of, uh, of tyrannosaurids among the theropods. So that's one. Uh, another is the, uh, although other people had noticed this in the past, I had done the first most comprehensive look at the limb proportions among different sorts of theropods and showed, you know, statistically the tyrannosaurids had very, for their size, long and gracile legs, uh, in addition to having this a shock absorbing foot, the archometatarsus, which is a structure that I named. Um, and so for their size, they were more cursorial than other theropods. Doesn't mean they're running at race more speeds when they're at eight tons, but it meant that a big tyrannosaurid would have been a faster mover than a big allosaurid, for instance. Gotcha. Um, and then the third would have been um, my work on the refutation of the obligate scavenging hypothesis that, um, you know, Horner puts forth this idea that tyrannosaurids couldn't actually kill their prey, um, and at least you put it as a testable hypothesis with a series of steps to get there, and so I went in there to show that, no, in fact, many of these ideas either do not prohibit you from being a scavenger or actually don't match what we see in the data. Um, and then that's not to say that an individual tyrannosaur at an individual growth stage at an individual season might have scavenged more than hunted. Certainly possibility. It would be very difficult to demonstrate one way or the other, but we can reject the obligate scavenging hypothesis. So I think those three things would be my main contributions to the field. Gotcha. Those are really good uh, things for sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cam, you're up next. All right, great. I'll ask mine. Uh, Dr. Holtz, my question is, why did early Tyrannosaurus, like Timberlingia neurotica, develop a more sophisticated brain than later Tyrannosaurus, like Tyrannosaurus rex? Yeah, well, so, uh, not so much that it was more sophisticated in, in Timberlingia. It's that Timberlingia is one of the first ones to show that really sophisticated brain that we see continued on in later Tyrannosaurids. Um, so you, know, you look at the brains of earlier tyrannosauroids, um, so you go down to DeLong or, or Guadalong and so forth, and, and they're sort of typical primitive solurosaur brains. Um, whereas we look at the derived ones like Tyrannosaurus and Aliaremus, um, and they've got different sorts of flexion in the brains, they've got 
the enhanced um, sections having to do with balance and hearing and so forth. Um, and Timurlingia seems to be the first one that we have studied to cross this threshold. Um, and unfortunately, so little is known of the skeleton of Timurlingia that it, we can't really correlate it with whatever anatomical changes are going on. Like, could it be that Timurlingia is one of the first ones with the arctometatarsus and the long slender legs? And maybe those are parts of these changes going on that you have to upgrade the, the hardware and the software in order to handle this new sorts of locomotion? Possibly, but we can't test that until we find the legs of Timurlingia in any detail. Or, you know, has its snout changed in some ways? Is it more like the broad tooth? later tyrannosaurids versus the blade-like tooth earlier tyrannosaur tyrannosauroids. Again, we can't really say yet with Timurlingia. So it's at a really intriguing part of, of the evolution of tyrannosauroids. And unfortunately, it's so tantalizingly incomplete. And it shows that we need to get out there and dig more, which is always a good thing. The species name is rather interesting. <laughs> oh, yes. yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, yeah the, so the full name, you know, uh, the, the uh, Timurlingia itself is named after Timurlane, so one of the great uh, um, Mongolian conquerors uh, gotcha. of the Middle Ages. So the idea of a central, because it's from Central Asia. Yeah, so yeah. Asian is, yeah. Well, I'm talking more about the species name, Timurlania erotica. Um, oh, that's yeah, what I was <laughs> referencing. Uh, Let's get the full, let's see, Timorlingia. It's actually, the, the full name here it is, uh, it's, yeah, Uotica. So oh, you are. Uotica, yes. So, which is good, good ear, the otic, the otic oh. capsule uh, of the brain. So it's well eared or good eared. So I think I think Cam must have misspelled it when he was writing it because he wrote uh, erotica. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, it was a typo. Yeah, I it was a typo. I didn't. I never heard of it, so I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't know if it was the right um, there's, there's, the right there's, there's one or not. The correct, but here's the correct spelling. Yeah, there you go. Um, oh, I see. I see. Yeah, Cam, you must have spelled it wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, it's autocorrect. Yeah. Auto, auto, quote unquote. <laughs> Yeah, Cam, your autocorrect must be screwing things up. Autocorrect. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Okay, who wants to go up next? Um, if Cam doesn't want to ask, uh, ask his other question, I have, I have a... I have about, like, two more questions. Okay. All right, Cam, I'll let you finish up yours. Yeah. Uh, do you think Rapture Rex is a juvenile Tarbosaurus? I think that Rapture Rex is almost certainly a juvenile... Whether it's a juvenile Tarbosaurus or not is more of a question. Um, and it's um, because of this whole issue of trying to establish exactly what formation it's from. Because you know, really, all we could say is it's from Tucson Rock Shops, uh, the Tucson <laughs> Rock Show. Uh, it's, uh, it's from Central Asia or it's from Eastern Asia. Um, but by the time it was sold, the information on where it was from had all been mixed up. So it's possible it's a juvenile Tarbosaurus, um, but we have other juvenile Tarbosaurus, and it's not exactly like the other ones. Um, it could be, for instance, a juvenile of something closer to Zhucheng Tyrannus, um, that certainly would be consistent with its uh, general spot in the world and its its age. When the specimen was first announced for sale, it was described as being Electrosaurus, uh, which we can't entirely reject because we know so little of the details of Electrosaurus, particularly of adult Electrosaurus. Uh, so. Um, it's one of these inconvenient, very inconvenient things that it's an intriguing specimen, it's a wonderful specimen, but uh, so much of that critical detail of exactly where and when it's from um, isn't present and that would have been very useful to help sorting some of the stuff out. Would it be an interesting it's research fun. topic if uh, someone were to go to those alleged locations and see if they can find more specimens? Absolutely, yeah. exactly, exactly. You know, follow up on those leads. 
Yeah, and see, if it, is it really from the Namek Formation? Is it from the Iren Davasu? Um, things of that nature, so, yeah. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, Sam, got your next one here. Yeah, okay. one more. Yeah, and I got my last question. Of course, you have to talk about Nano Tyrannus and Juvenile Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rexite. Insert face palm. I think one of the things that I think, because I'm on the side of Nano Tyrannus being a Juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that is all is because of the lags, you know, the lines of arrested growth. We have cut open or done a bone histology of uh, these animals that we thought were Nano Tyrannus, its own species, but come to find out, based upon the uh, lines of arrested growth, that it was actually going growing rapidly. So I am on the side of Nano Tyrannus being a juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex instead of its own species. I would like to know your opinions on that. Sure. Well, I'll say this much, that the, the, the specimens of so-called Nano Tyrannus specimens studied so far have all proven to be juveniles. So whether it's the type skull, or gene, or presumably, although it's not been studied in any detail, the specimen that's on display in, um, in um, Florida, um, and it still also, uh, also hasn't been uh, studied yet, but the dueling dinosaur specimen. Um, none of them show adult traits, and they all show definite juvenile traits. So we can establish that they're juveniles. Uh, they're juveniles from uh, the Help Creek, so a formation in which all the adult Tyrannosaurids known are from Tyrannosaurus rex. So, we have a couple different possibilities. One is that there's one taxon known only from juveniles, apparently from juveniles of like a couple year age bracket. And then another taxon known only from adults and maybe some very small babies. Uh, that's Tyrannosaurus rex. Or that they're all one growth series. The latter one requires the fewest assumptions, so it's the more parsimonious argument. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the strong, uh, the strongest uh, line of argument, all told, is the parsimony argument, that all of the things being equal, um, the fact that we have one taxon known only from one growth stage and another one from a different growth stage and they're from the same formation and otherwise they share lots of traits with each other that aren't found in any other Tyrannosaurid uh, would mean that the, the idea of Thanos as juvenile T-Rex is the simpler explanation. It doesn't mean it's correct, it means it's simpler and therefore it's our preferred explanation and it's a testable one because all we need to do and I've been saying this since Carr first proposed the idea of Dano Tyrannus as a juvenile T-Rex. All we need to do is find an adult Tyrannosaur, uh, sorry, an adult Nano Tyrannus that is distinctly not Tyrannosaurus Rex, or a you know nine to eleven year old Tyrannosaurus Rex, which is unquestionably not Nano Tyrannus. And either of those discoveries could overturn the single species hypothesis. Until we have those discoveries, it's the simpler and therefore, in my opinion, the preferred solution. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be... What about the uh, dueling dinosaurs? What about those? Are we ever going to do scientific research on those? Well, specimens? exactly. You know, once those specimens are available for scientific research, they might be really useful. Uh, but we don't have access to them yet. And unfortunately, a lot of the hype that's come out about it um, is not entirely correct. Like, for example, this discussion of the arms. Uh, and the problem with the arms is that it is the most complete Hell Creek Tyrannosaurid arm ever discovered. And most of the comparisons people have been making are to composite specimens or ones where they're not even composites, they're just invented. Um, that we don't have a complete adult Tyrannosaurus Rex arm to compare it to. And so to have this complete thing and show that it's different than something that's made up, you know, that's not science. That's actually not really comparing it to, uh, uh, to something we know. Um, and I'll say this, we do not have, at least certainly we don't have published, uh, 
the definite um, thumb and thumb claw of Tyrannosaurus rex yet. Um, so people say, oh, look at how big the thumb claw is on the specimen. But if you go to a mounted skeleton of Tyrannosaurus rex, that thumb claw is made up. We, it's not a real specimen that it's based off of, and therefore we can't actually use it as positive evidence. Um, so um, it's, it is definitely possible that you could have a smaller Tyrannosaur and a larger Tyrannosaur in the same environment. We know that in the Nemect, we have Oliaramus and, and Tarvasaurus. So it's definitely a possibility. Uh, but, you know, just because the possibility doesn't mean that it's the preferred answer, all things hmm. considered. It's interesting. I'll be going with uh, Tyler Leeson this summer out to Hell Creek, so I hope I can be on the forefront of discovering anything possible to help uh, yeah, further yeah, that there research. There definitely are some adults and juvenile tyrannosaurid material out there. We've, with the bird food, we've come across uh, additional specimens since. Now, some of them are really crappy. Some of them are weathering, like a femur weathering out. Yeah. It's falling apart. We can't see if there's any other rest of the specimen yet. But it's about the same size as Jane. So the specimens are there. Um, and so it's a matter of finding it. And like with so many things, uh, what we need are the intermediate specimens, one way or another, to help sort these things out. When you got one data point here and one data point here, you know, we need to start filling in the data in between to see are we seeing a trend or are we seeing two trends, you know, one thing or two things. Yeah, exactly. I hope to help yeah. uh, find, you know, with the Denver Museum crew to help find more specimens that might help answer some of those questions. Um, we're we're going to be, uh, I'm going to take a question from the comment forum on uh, Greg's post. So this is a okay. question from uh, Brendan Lee, and his question is, why is anatomy, zoology, and botany rare in paleontology courses? And he wonders also why biology and geology are very common in those things. Um, yeah, well, it's, in a large part, it's sort of the issue that, um, anatomy, zoology, botany, in general, are not being taught very much, um, at all. Um, not just for paleontologists, but for anyone, um, that there are certainly lots of people, like lots of professional biologists, who look at things like anatomy or zoology as sort of old-fashioned 19th century natural history and looking down on it because of that, and that real science is molecular or cellular. Um, and they have a valid point in terms of funding, that people will be likely to get jobs going out of university if they go into molecular biology, if they yeah, go into cellular yeah. work or histological work or stuff like that. So, and additionally, there's lots of important research going on in those fields. There's a lot of good funding for it in terms of research. So yeah, a lot yeah. of work is going that way. The problem that means is that when universities have to cut programs or cut classes uh, down to save money, it's going to be these quote unquote old fashioned sciences that often bear the brunt of that. Um, and so you're get you're getting, you know, you can have biology students at a university who've never really taken a, a real zoology class or a real anatomy class. Uh, which is a shame, because even if you are going on as a molecular biologist, you should learn about zoology or botany. And the same goes the other direction. Even if you're going on as a botanist or a zoologist, you definitely should learn about molecular biology as well. Um, and a similar sort of thing on the geological side where you're finding some places that aren't emphasizing the old sedimentology, stratigraphy, old-fashioned paleontology type stuff. Um, and um, it's often really the, the paleontologists themselves who are keeping both sides of that equation alive. So. You know, paleontologists trying to make sure that people still go out there and learn, you know, depositional systems and, and stratigraphy and so forth. And on the biological side, you know, teaching the anatomy classes and so forth. Uh, Larry Whitmer's lab has been extraordinarily helpful, among others. Oh, yeah, is, yeah. Was famous in oh, sort yeah, of resurrecting yeah. the old, with new technology, but the old idea of looking at whole organ systems 
and so forth, and showing that you can do 21st century science on respiration or heat transfer or retractile muscles of the nose. Or yeah, whatever. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. He does really do some good work, and fortunately, my high school has an anatomy course. It's a semester-long ah, course, yeah, and I'm trying to Love currently get in there um, for next semester, and I'm, you know, really hoping. And I, I'm, I've already been aware of this too that like those kind of courses are a little bit short for the reasons you mentioned, but it's yeah. kind of fortunate. Not only like there's a course available, but it's a high school course rather than a college course, which is a lot more common than in a high school setting. So. Yeah, I think oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting. For... Yeah, and you know, there are even even medical students. Uh, there are there's a push among some areas, in part for expense and in part for other reasons, to try to decrease the number of cadaver gross anatomy classes and use more digital technology, which granted would be cheaper. And so yeah, forth. exactly. But, you know, I when I have a doctor working on me, I want someone who's actually <laughs> seen a spleen before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the real, I have the to real agree world, with that. Uh, rather than someone who's only seen it digitally, so. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really prepare them for the real thing. Exactly. Among other things, individual variation. I mean, it's something that, uh, well, as paleontologists, we have to consider. <laughs> also, you know, medical yeah. doctors consider that there are. For any given feature, there's some variation in it in any population, and sometimes Absolutely. it can be radically different. Sometimes it'll mostly won't be, but sometimes it can be, and that could be misleading to us in paleontology. We might think that the difference is, is taxonomic, and it really is just an individual variation. And more importantly, in medicine, it might oh, actually be the decision between life and death. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. You don't understand the variation. Yeah, I think understanding the individual versus taxonomic differences would be a good mm -hmm. thing because it yeah, may prevent problems. Bracketing and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indeed. All right. All right, I'll go up next with this with this question, which was asked by these two group members, Adya Surnath and Paleo Investor Kiefer Brown. It's a combination question because they're asking the same thing. Hmm. Kiefer asks, it's become popular in paleo art to depict theropods with lips as opposed to exposed dentition. Is there sufficient fossil evidence to justify this trend, or are traditional reconstructions more accurate in this regard? Um, we The answer to that is we don't entirely know yet. Uh, sadly, uh, but somewhat predictably, we don't have good skin impression of the faces of dinosaurs yet. Uh, and I say somewhat predictably, is if you go out there in nature and you find... Um, dead animals out there. One of the first things to go is often the face. Uh, that's a, it's relatively thin tissue there. It's something a lot weather and and and, and parasites and well, the decay organisms, the scavengers can easily strip it away. The face first, and it, that's what we see in the skeletons as well, or the the, the preserved skin impressions. Um, there was a recent set of presentations. Now the paper itself. I don't think it's quite out yet. Um, so we can't evaluate all the detail. But a couple of presentations um, where the suggestion has been made that the quality of the enamel as preserved in things like theropods and rawasukians and other, you know, blade toothed um, um, fossil animals. Uh, suggests that they were protected by lips um, and that they weren't exposed to the air for long periods of time. Uh, I'm not certain that we actually have the strong enough evidence to really support that, uh, but again, we haven't been able to evaluate the paper in its detail, so they might have something, something strong going on there. Um, and it certainly is true that Many modern animals are lippier uh, than we might give them credit for, like varanid lizards, yeah. or in fact, many lizards. If you mm -hmm. compare their actual skull with the shape of the, the the actual living animal's face, you wouldn't necessarily get the degree to which they have lips around the, the teeth. Um, so, personally, I would say. It, it's an unresolved question. I would keep an open mind with regard to lips. Uh, I won't discredit them right away. 
uh, but that we don't have um, the direct evidence for it yet. Um, and the circumstantial evidence that's been presented, we haven't seen it in the paper format where we could go back and check the details that they have in it. But hopefully that'll be out soon. Yeah, I hope so too. Thanks, thanks for your question. And Sam, what's up next? Uh, some paleontologists theorized that had Tyrannosaurus rex not gone extinct, it may have eventually lost its arms. What are your views on that? Sure. So um, the idea that uh, that Tyrannosaurids, had they survived, had the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction not been as severe, um, would have entirely lost their arms. I think it's, it's quite reasonable because the arm reduction was a fairly late phenomenon in Tyrannosaur history. Uh, whatever use they were doing with their arms, it probably wasn't a critical use. So that's the sort of thing that nature can continue reduction on. Um, so as much as we can say anything is likely or unlikely when we're talking about alternate universes, um, I think it's, it's definitely not unlikely that the complete loss of limbs, of four limbs rather, uh, would have been possible in a pseudo history of, of an alternate history of Tyrannosaurids. Good answer. Um, my other question is, do you think a human could outrun a Tyrannosaurus? Yeah. So, um, the, um, of course, the question uh, is normally asked about adult Tyrannosaurus, because there's going to be a difference between, say, an 8-ton adult Tyrannosaurus versus, a, you know, 500-kilogram um, specimen. Uh, for an adult Tyrannosaurus, I think a human could easily outrun a Tyrannosaurus Rex if his last name is Bolt. Uh, that is the very, very fastest human beings probably would be faster than a full-grown T-Rex. But whether your average human being would be faster than an adult T-Rex, I think that case hasn't really been made. Uh, there have been some biomechanical arguments that yes, they would have been um, slower uh, than an average adult human, but I don't know that those are necessarily that strong argument. Uh, in particular, I think uh, we have a lot, we're still learning about things like power walking. Um, so there's no suspended phase. There might not even be a compliant phase, compressive phase in there. Uh, and still you're covering a lot of ground pretty quickly. Um, I think any model that comes up with an adult T-Rex as being slower than an adult elephant is wrong. I think that's basically something that we could just look at the anatomy of these organisms and say, okay, if that's the result, then there's something wrong in the model. Let's look at the details of the model and figure out what's going on. All that said, that's about the adult T-Rex. I don't think any human being has ever lived uh, that could outrun a chain-sized juvenile T-Rex. Um, those animals are probably among the fastest dinosaurs of the Mesozoic, uh, but except for the uh, Ornithomimosaurs. Uh, I think, or the Ornithomimids. It's not even most of the Ornithomimids are probably faster. The Ornithomimids are probably faster than it. Um, but beyond that, I mean, they're so gracile, uh, and they don't have all the limitations of being a multi-ton animal. Um, that something like a chain size specimen, I think it outrun any human being that's ever been around. You know, a human, the human response would be run to a car and then get away. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much, Thomas. Yeah, good answer. Yeah, yeah, good. And, um, and of course, my question uh, is actually, uh, was there a paleontologist or two that inspired you to become a paleontologist? Sure. I, I'd say there's, you know, lots, lots of them, and it depends upon where I was in, in my life cycle. So um, when I was very young and first reading about dinosaurs, you know, some of the ones <clears throat> that would inspire me would have been uh, Mary Anning. It used to be every dinosaur book would begin by talking about, or any kid dinosaur book would talk about Mary Anning, even though she never actually found any dinosaurs. She was a good example of someone who's about the age who was finding dinosaurs, you know, when she was a, a teenager, so kids could relate. Um, or she's finding uh, fossil reptiles, at least, as a, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and also people like Roy Chapman Andrews, who granted wasn't actually a paleontologist, he was a, a whale, uh, he worked on modern whales, but he did organize a major expedition, uh, the expedition to Central Asia, and he wrote a bunch of popular books that were still, you know, hmm. common in, in libraries and that kids would be, like me would be checking out. So those were sort of inspirational. And then when I was getting a little older, oh, not that much older in hindsight, um, uh, Bob Bakker was pretty influential because in the 70s he was getting you know, national attention on documentaries and so forth. Um, and in particular, uh, in 75, he had this article come out in Scientific American, and my mom got this for me, even though Scientific American is a little over my head at the time, but it's an article called Dinosaur Renaissance, a very influential article as it turned out for the history of paleontology. And that was really the first case when I read about paleontology as a science. So before then, it always been, you know, a dinosaur book with a, this creature, you know, this creature lives this long and lived at this time and in this environment and ate these things. And that was cool, um, but that wasn't really learning about science. That was learning about the discoveries. And what Dinosaur Renaissance did is it actually asked particular questions. In this case, it mostly having to do with uh, the physiology of dinosaurs, and then tested it by using data. Uh, and that was sort of an eye-opening thing, that you could do more about fossil creatures than just look at them and say how cool they were. You could try to figure out how they lived in using this sort of, of, of data. So that was, so Bakker was pretty influential in that context for me. Um, and in fact, I wanted to study with him as an undergraduate, so I went to Hopkins specifically to work with him, but he actually, he was at Johns Hopkins only for a year when I was there, and he left during my freshman year, and he didn't work much with undergraduates anyway. Um, but I got to work with other um, paleontologists and geologists then. Um, and, but throughout, all throughout my career, I've had various paleontologists who've been, you know, helping me out, who have been looking up to and giving me good information, whether it was the folks at the Smithsonian, so people like Mike Brett Sermon, and uh, Ralph Chapman, who was there at the time, and Hans Seuss, who was there at the time, and he's since come back there. Um, or later on, you know, people who helped me in my early professional career, like Phil Curry and uh, Jim Farlow and Peter Dodson and Dale Russell. Uh, but of course, most especially as a graduate student, when I worked with John Ostrom, that's my mentor, who's a really influential one, who I looked up to. And uh, so, you know, all throughout my career, you know, I've had various people um, that have looked up to, that have gotten inspiration from, and so forth. You know what, that reminds me of a story with uh, with Bob Bakker, you know, I, when I was about 14 I started volunteering at the Morrison Natural History Museum, which is about a half an hour uh, west from Denver, and there were two paleontologists there, uh, Matthew Mossbrucker, who does a lot of work with uh, stegosaur tracks, and then obviously Bob Bakker, but the thing was, kind of being younger and not really as scientific literate as I am now, I really was nowhere, like, I no idea about how influential he was for like the first five months I just kind of saw I, we called him Dr. Bob that's kind of what I call him you saw doc, I kind of just saw him as a, a regular guy and then I, I see online all these things about all these people saying how much of an influence he is the next time I see him you should have seen how much of a of a, of a fanboy I was reacting to him when I first saw him like <laughs> oh my god I did not know you were this influential God, like God amongst people, kind of guy. It was, it was. Oh, you, you should have seen me when I, I was so eccentric. Uh, but I. Well, LeBron, it, LeBron it, James of paleontology. <laughs> yeah, you know it's oh, crazy for like five months of the the time I was there, or five months of yeah. I I was not even close to aware of the impact he's had in the community. I just kind of saw him as a another guy uh, that worked there. So just you know, like he's just a bearded guy who who looks at the, some fossils, and I'm like you know the, the the see him you know, all this stuff about him I would just again you should have you would have had to just see my reaction the 14 year old freaking about. Yeah, one of my favorite stories. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my influences are mainly um, like. Uh, like of course you are one of my inspirations, and um, 
and uh, um, Bakker is actually one of my inspirations. Uh, Phil Curry is actually an inspiration to me, mm. and uh, uh, Ostrom as well. And uh, I kind of actually um, kind of starting to get into inspiration with uh, uh, Cope and Marsh, and I think those guys actually were like ahead of their time um, when they actually were discovering these fossils and uh, minus the uh, sabotage and uh, and all that. But uh, um, but at that time they were actually kind of like uh, bitter rivals, but now that's kind of realized that in today's science that's not going to work, and so it's it's understandable, and I can understand why that those two were rivals, and um, and uh, there's still inspiration to many many scientists, especially paleontologists and biologists. Uh, oh yeah. I don't think blowing up another person's site would really fly too well as today. <laughs> no, 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 You know, blowing up a dynam- bl- blowing up a your rival site with dynamite. I mean, yeah, that w- that wouldn't fly in today's day. Or stealing fossils from the other site, or sending people yeah. to spy on and infiltrate sabotage. Yeah, yeah as, as I was just saying, minus the sabotage. You know, with, with, with him praising those guys, I said minus the sabotage. <laughs> Yeah. Which included all the all everything we just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah and Celia may like... have been one of those lost fossils, possibly. Oh God, yeah. I know. Yeah, that was a big one. Big is an understatement in this case. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. If you guys don't remember, you guys, I'm gonna run through Scott's questions here. That's, That's fine. Mention, pick up a memory. All right, his first question was, what was the connection between Spinosaurus and the giant sawfish Onchopristus? Sure. Um, so, um, we have good evidence that Spinosaurids in general and Spinosaurus among them um, were more piscivorous or more fish eating than typical theropod dinosaurs. But when you're up at um, Spinosaurus size, then uh, you know your average trout or salmon isn't going to do it. Um, so they had to feed on a larger body. Fish. And it turns out there are a number of large-bodied fish that co-occur with Spinosaurus, and among these are the um, the giant uh, estuarine or brackish water um, uh, coelacanth, uh, um, Masonia, uh, but also a very big sawfish, Onychopristus. Um, there are some specimens of Onychopristus that have been interpreted as having uh, bite marks from Spinosaurus on them. And it's certainly uh, not unreasonable. I don't think we've got really good, strong evidence that are necessarily Spinosaurus teeth rather than the large body crocodilian teeth, but it's consistent with them. Um, Even if we don't have the direct evidence, um, the argument is quite reasonable. This is a a large bodied fish that occurs in the same environment. I think one of the reasons that we we think about this pairing so much is because it's it's about basically become a paleo art meme, and I think the reason it's become that is because both the animals are so weird looking. So Spinosaurus is weird looking even as theropod dinosaurs go, um, and sawfish are just really weird looking fish, um, and so putting the two of them in the same picture is just uh, an interesting looking thing. And even more interesting because it's a quite likely uh, actual interaction. Uh, so I think that's the uh, the main reason we tend to see that particular pairing in a lot of paleo art. Um, it's it's not unlikely and it's interesting looking. <laughs> All right, on to the next one here. Oh, it sounds like I can find it real quick here. All right, the next one. What were the evolutionary predators that led to the spinosaurus becoming predominantly fish eaters? Yeah, now that's a good question as to what really got them going in that direction. Now, megalosauroids in general, of which spinosaurids are one, do have somewhat longer snouts for their skull height than some of the other large theropods. Um, but most of the, you know, Pietnitskisaurids and megalosaurids, the earlier branches, don't show any particular fish-eating adaptations. But by the time we pick up Spinosaurids, they've gotten this longer snout and these conical teeth that would be more associated with, with grabbing fish, um, as well as still eating you know, terrestrial vertebrates. Um, now, we don't necessarily know what the trigger 
might be why they would have started doing this, but part of it would simply be, may have been, that there is a resource that is available, uh, a protein that's nearby in, in the shallow water, and we certainly have plenty of modern animals, modern terrestrial carnivores that get protein from the water, so grizzly bears being famous at this, but there's other ones as well. Um, and so it would probably have been the you know, protospinosaurids are beginning to eat more fraction of their food from the water um, than other typical theropods, and that happened to be a successful way of life, and so those forms, those descendants that were even better at it um, were were more successful, and part of the getting better at it is the elongation of the snout and the transformation of teeth from blades to cones, and eventually, you know, the moving backwards of the nostrils, so the nostrils are placed further up, so you can dip the snout into the water deeper, and there's some suggestion that Spinosaurus and maybe some of the other advanced Spinosaurids may have had pressure-sensitive um, organs, uh, basically pre pressure touch sensors in the snout, the way many crocodilians do. Um, so um, um, we see this trend through time of more and more adaptation towards getting food out of the water. Of course, the big question is the most derived one, Spinosaurus, you know, to what degree was it aquatic? Now, the recent, the new reconstructions of Spinosaurus, I think there are certain problems with it because they're very much a composite. And when you, when you combine composite material together and get some really weird proportions, is that because the animal had weird proportions or that you are not scaling properly? Um, so that said, the hind end of a Spinosaurus specimen, including the legs and hips, do seem to go together. And they do show disproportionately short uh, limbs a very small ilium for its size, it's a very small hip for its size, and what I think is most intriguing, this uh, very dense bone with almost all the medullary cavity reduced, the hollow cavity at the middle, um, which that thickening of the bone is something that we see in, in aquatic animals, um, animals that are actually spending a fair amount of time in the water, and the fact that something like Suchomimus, an earlier Spinosaurus, doesn't show it, uh, is suggestive that Spinosaurus has gotten even further in terms of becoming aquatic than its uh, more primitive kin. Okay, thank you for that one. I'll get on to the next part from Scott's laundry list of questions here. All right, the next one. Have marine reptiles been found in the deposits of Spinosaurus? Yeah, as far as I can find, there isn't really good definite co-occurrence of Spinosaurus and marine reptiles uh, in the same horizons. Now, um, Spinosaurus is normally found in estuarine, that is brackish water uh, environments, and so there is a marine component to that. And there have been at some of these sites in Northern Africa, um, submarine reptiles found in those formations, but I can't say that they're at the same level as the Spinosaurus specimens. So what you could be having going on is occasionally the water invades the inland even more, so the sea level rises, and there you might get the, the marine reptiles, and then it drains more, and you're getting more of a continental influence, and that's when you're getting the dinosaurs. So, to my knowledge, they haven't been found at the same level. Um, all that said, uh, almost certainly the two would have encountered each other to some degree because some of these marine reptiles would have been coming inland to some degree, um, just as even today, because like bull sharks uh, can swim up rivers quite far from the sea, and those are animals that are, are water breathers. In the case of marine reptiles, are air breathers, so they don't have that limitation. Um, and Spinosaurus, I'm sure, would have, especially if it was eating lots of big marine fish, would have gone away from shore to a certain degree. So there would have been some overlap in their ranges. That, that makes sense. All right, the last one that Scott had was, let me see here, 
Oh, Jesse wanted to know what you knew about the types of freshwater fish that have been found in the same sediments and deposits as Spinosaurus. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch, and I am not that much of a fish expert, so I tend to focus on the really fancy ones, the unusual ones. Um, so, as I mentioned already, things like uh, Onychopristus and, um, and Masonia uh, are very, very large fish. Uh, there's plenty of smaller fish in the same environment with them. Uh, and I wish I could remember the artist's name. There's a paleo artist who has done a series of illustrations of fish from the Baharia and the Kem Kem, which are the two main formations from which we get um, Spinosaurus. Uh, and they're actually quite good. He's being very, uh, I think it's he actually, I don't know for certain it's he, uh, very comprehensive in terms of hmm. trying to document all the fossil fish that are from there. Um, but yeah, if you, uh, I offhand can't remember the whole level of diversity, although as I seem to remember, so we've got coelacanths, there are probably lungfish, there are definitely sharks, uh, including sawfish, um, almost certainly there are um, gars, because um, gars are fairly common in the Cretaceous, um, and probably some other Holostean type fish. But beyond that, I can't say for certain what all is in those beds. Okay, I've got one last question. This is from my friend Rochelle out in California. She mm. wanted to know what your take was on Spinosaurus itself, if you believe it to be a biped or a quadruped. Good question. Uh, good question, yeah. yeah. I think the evidence that they were quadrupedal is not particularly convincing. Uh, this is one of those things where they don't actually have the forelimbs associated with the body. And so I believe they are scaling inappropriately. Um, indeed, there is a question as to whether the humerus that they are basing it off of is even from Spinosaurus. Uh, Andrea Cao and others have suggested it was actually a Robachisaurus humerus, mm. so a sauropod humerus, which we would expect to be quite large. Um, it, Spinosaurus was not a big striding biped in the sense that a Tyrannosaur or a Carcharodontosaur or even an early Spinosaurid would have been, uh, given what we know of its leg proportions. But I think it could still have been a biped and just not a particularly fast one, and probably not one that spent a lot of time on land, but something moving around maybe more like a pangolin. Uh, the bipedal pangolins, I think, are a... a possible analog. Now, they're not a direct analog. They're much smaller, and they have a more crouched stance in terms of their legs, but they show us that something can have sort of heavy forequarters um, and still move around on land as a biped. Um, so, I think that we would need to actually find those forelimbs in association with the same skeleton, or with enough of the skeleton that we can scale the forelimbs and hind limbs together to show that the forelimbs were being used for locomotion. And on top of that, there's going to have to be a lot of transformation of the forelimb of a theropod in order for it to support weight. Uh, you know, they didn't have those pronated hands. They have the inward facing palms. You're going to have to do something with that in order for them to bear weight. Not to say they couldn't, I and mean, that transformation happened in the history of the sauropodomorphs, so we know they were able to do it, although it took them a long time to do it. Um, so there's nothing that would stop a theropod from doing that, but we don't have any positive evidence on that. Yeah, I've talked very, to... Very, very good, Don. Uh, I've talked to Jim Kirkland and Joe Surich about this, and they they also believe the whole uh, bi or uh, quadruped thing is also kind of uh, unlikely. Um, yeah. For the reasons that kind of the the idea of it walking around on its knuckles just seems kind of as you just stated with trying to make it you know transforming yeah, those forehands to do something like that just seems unlikely and it, for for the i mean I, as you said spinosaurus is not like a super heavy animal but it is you know generally large and for it to do that mm -hmm. I, I feel like it'd be unlikely to, to try to support its weight that way and then along with the other evidence with the mismatched uh possible mismatch of different elements from it. So yeah, I totally yeah. I have to agree with uh, with what you have to say. So I'm going to ask my next question, and this is more of an advice question for people like Cam and I. 
So my question is, do you have any advice for teenagers such as Cam and I and others on how to get involved with getting research, you know, paleontology research? Um, yeah, and you've actually, uh, a couple of you have alluded to some of it already. Uh, one of the things is if you are in an area where this is possible, um, uh, to be able to get some work done um, and volunteer work or whatever with local museums or nature centers um, uh, where there's you know maybe a chance to get in there, maybe help in their preparation lab, or if they do, um, if they want docents to help be fossil hall explainers, so you get to meet with the people. I mean, get meet with meet with the researchers and possibly even work hands on with the fossils. Um, if you have the chance of actually getting out into the fields, so sometimes when groups are having expeditions out in the field, they'll be advertising it. So keep an eye out for it on the web um, or newsletters from local uh, museums or or whatever. Um, that to get that real hands-on, you know, field experience. Uh, those are the main sorts of things. If there are public talks that are being, being given, you know, make sure you get to them and, and maybe meet with the people afterwards. Um, that uh, personal connection and actual getting your hands onto specimens, those are really helpful. And the earlier you can start getting that done, the better. Yeah, and to kind of elaborate on my question, you know, in fact, almost everything you mentioned is stuff I'm either doing right now or am planning on doing. My question is a little bit more towards working on papers and actual research, sort of like that. Sure. But, you know, obviously for teens and younger people who don't have the opportunities or haven't attempted to do those things, that's obviously good advice because I can vouch for that. I've done almost everything. Yeah, those would be the first, the first step. So the next step in terms of actually getting involved in the, in the research is when you've got those connections, ask the people that you've met with if there's some part of a project that you can help out with. Um, it often, particularly if there's ongoing expeditions, there's going to be a bunch of different things that need to get done. Um, and so they might say, okay, you could be responsible for this particular subpart of the project. Um, and, you know, maybe that could be something that winds up being a publication, uh, maybe of your own or maybe, you know, where you're contributing as part of a, a larger team, a uh, multi-author paper or something. Um, um, so, yeah, asking about if there's something that you can help out with in terms of the post field part of the work uh, it might be sorting of specimens and doing specimens counts some statistical analysis or something um, uh, it might be uh, having to do with logging data of where you collected where the specimens were collected and you're helping to create a map a field map or something like that um, so yeah, to find out if there is any particular opportunity, what that opportunity is going to be is going to be different from project to project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can contribute your particular part to it. Um, also, if there are local, because there is a growing number of these local conferences um, where, you know, uh, Paleo Fest at the Burpee or yeah. Dino Fest at the um, um, at Utah England, Museum and, or um, oh, the other one. There's the Utah uh, one coming up. A bunch of other uh, societies, too, things like uh, Geological Society of America has their regional conferences. Uh, there's Sigma Chi, the student science organization, where often they'll have um, presentations and they might even have poster sessions that are geared towards students. Uh, uh, so to be able to get your results presented at those, you know, if you start learning how to present information early on, that means it'll be even better when you're an undergraduate and then I'll have time to a graduate student and so forth. Um, so, and, and, and uh, plus, conferences like that are a great place to network, to meet not only the other scientists, but other people uh, 
of your own age or other ages who are interested in the field uh, and they themselves may have made important connections and I say hey, last summer I went out with so-and-so maybe you could come out and, and join us for that and so yeah of course you know my question is more like well you know thinking of something I can contribute that you know some of these parts of these papers require either a lot of like skill or a lot of knowledge in a particular something yeah, you know something for me you know where I'm not exactly super experienced nor super knowledgeable I was wondering what that might be but as you said what those different uh, topics might be um, would depend but yeah I think that's some really good advice I appreciate it and I'm sure yeah. Cam does as well since it's something he's well, kind of looking in yeah for instance one thing that might be is if you've done um, if part of the expedition has to do with microsite work uh, where you're collecting um, microvertebrates or even you know that, that's sort of the, the, the vertebrate bias or if it might have been like plankton stuff or whatever yeah or yeah uh, they'll often need people to sort out the specimens uh, yeah screen washing right the, the, the stuff that you've, you've sifted out onto slides and then count them up and often that's the sort of thing where you don't necessarily need to be a specialist on it so long as you someone has explained to you or given you the data of how to sort it out what how what are the categories you're looking for and how you recognize them and then you spend some time sorting in slides and then counting up the data in there and then maybe the more experienced members of the team then go further with with that stuff but that initial level of, of sorting it out is something that you can help out with so you know getting all the different sort of shark teeth maybe uh, yeah and yeah teeth or something from uh, a dig site gotcha okay thank you thomas i yeah. really appreciate sure. it yeah i was re uh, two, uh, it's gonna be like uh i think three years yeah three years uh, into the middle of May, I was actually in a regional trip to uh, South Dakota, and I actually got to uh, do some fossil hunting in uh, Pierce Shale formations. Oh, nice. And that was actually kind of pretty cool. I got to find, like, uh, ammonites, and uh, mm. some people found uh, bell knights, and, and uh, one person did find a shark tooth. Very oh, cool. nice. I think one of the things that I'm probably working on specifically towards research is that my colleague and I, we're working in the Cambrian uh, Conasaga Formation in Northwest Georgia, and we believe we found the first trilobite hatchlings of this state. And so right now we're trying to converse with uh, some paleontologists from Columbus State University, like Dr. David Swimmer, and another paleontologist, and I think Richard Forty, we're trying to contact him as well. And uh, we're trying to get some research and work on an abstract of that right now. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, getting out there, collecting, and it may even be places that people have collected before, but they haven't been lucky enough or persistent enough to actually find those particular specimens. So that's that's great. You know, that's the sort of thing that, yeah, that and that could be, can then build up for, particularly if these are the first ever for a particular formation definitely could be the foundation of a, of a paper that can go on to to you know get published somewhere so yeah. yeah i don't want to speak for cam but he also wants to uh you know go with robert gay who's the paleontologist i've done work over this summer mm -hmm. you know i've gotten out in the field and i'm going to currently start doing some research with him but that's another thing i know he wants to do and i'm currently trying to help him try to get into this program with us and help our research out in South uh, East Utah in the Chinle. Right. Yeah, that's some yeah, good stuff we've got going what on. What I'm currently doing now is reading up some scientific papers and taking notes on Phytosaurus and Metalposaurus and a little bit expanding on that topic. Yeah, you got a lot of papers yeah. from there. Yeah. So, might as well move on to the next question. <laughs> okay. Um, I think Cam, you had a question after me. Is that right, or is is someone else coming up next? I don't remember the order. Uh, I think it was me. Yeah, the, I yeah, thought so too. You got two of them. All right, uh, I'll ask my first one. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a a debate, really. You know, when, when a lot of people teach evolution, they teach about you know the human, uh, the the monkey turning into a human, which I think is very very false. That's not how evolution works. Even when I was in biology class in, in the ninth grade in uh, high school, um, they were still teaching evolution as, you know, as a, 
a, a, a straight line, but we know that evolution is more uh, tree-based, it's more constructed like a tree. And mm -hmm. my question is, how can we get people who are teaching science classes to, I guess, uh, to, to make evolution as it was uh, uh, designed like a tree in some sense? Yeah, there's, um, that is a persistent problem. I think okay. I think it's something on Scott's end. Okay, okay. Because it, it says something we about. Drop, we might have to drop Scott from the call together, possibly. Yeah, because uh, there's a su there, on his on his thing it says uh, his his call the call to him failed, so it mu something must have uh, dropped on his end. Okay. So yeah, we might have I to just you, do that. Have you said have, how many of you how much have you got recorded so far? I got all all of it recorded. I just uh, well right. I think. Right when Thomas was starting to ask the question, the audio, I noticed the audio on his end was yeah, he's not muted. He like he got muted. Yeah. 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 So I think you might have to just restart uh, answering the question. Um, okay. And then we'll have yeah. to see. And then you might have to mess to Scott, letting him know we probably just have to exclude him. Yeah. But I yeah. think he'll have okay. to sit it out. So yeah. We'll continue with, uh, kind of restart with answering oh, the question. Because I, I think I got Cam recording. The question, okay. but I think it cut out once you started answering. Sure, so I could just start with the beginning of my answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, there's, like Cam pointed out, there's a lot of misconceptions about evolution, and that they're not just limited um, to teachers, although sadly a lot of biology pe teachers have these misconceptions, but they're uh, misunderstood more broadly in science communication. And, uh, that is a big, a big problem, and there are some organizations that are trying to fight uh, about this um, and try to get a better understanding. And uh, one is the Understanding Evolution Project, uh, which is evolution.berkeley.edu. Uh, it's from the um, University of California at Berkeley and the, uh, their Museum of Paleontology where a big part of what they do is trying to to get people in tree-based thinking, as it's called. Um, and so they have entire lesson plans online of understanding tree-based thinking and so forth. Um, there's also the National Center for Science Education uh, that's similarly, that's ncse.org, I believe. Um, and they are trying to get that information out there. Uh, and, and newer textbooks, uh, some of the newer biology textbooks that have a real evolution emphasis um, have, uh, like some of Carl, Carl Zimmer ones, um, are, are trying to get that out there. But the problem with a lot of changes in education is it, it takes time because people become set in their ways often when they learn something or when they started to teach it, it's hard for them to start thinking about it in a new way, to convey it in a new way. Um, 
And so, you know, thankfully, a lot of times teachers are required to do a certain number of courses or activities every year to make sure they stay up to date. But, you know, they don't always necessarily do the ones that they need. Um, so, yeah, trying to get tree-based thinking out there. Uh, it's important for, you know, museum design. It's important for, uh, for news reports on things. And they don't always do the best job, although I'll say they're doing a lot better than they used to. Um, because so much of understanding evolution is understanding that it's branching not a single line change. You, you, could, you could, in principle, you could take any tip and walk your way back down and talk about the changes that happened down that path, but that's, you could ignore, you know, 99.99% of the stuff that's going on if you look at it that way. Gotcha. That sounds like Cam's having audio bugs. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can you, uh, Cam? Can you type in your next, type your next question in? Oh, Cam. If you can type his next one in, and then we can, one of us could answer for him while he gets his audio fixed. Yeah, I can, I can, um, I can ask the question for him, and I think Christopher's question's next. Is that right? Yes, he, he was yes. gonna go up right to Cameron. All right, and then Sam's after that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then I'll, and then I'll ask a question from the, from the forum. Yeah, another one from Kiefer Brown. Cam's gone. Yeah. And he's he's logging the he's going off and going back on. Oh, uh, probably. Um. Yeah, just call it a blooper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought bloopers were supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. That's well, true. They are funny, sort of. Well, in the movie, they are funny, but yeah. in real life, not so much. It just, it just crap going wrong. That's all they are. Yeah. Well, I hope he's trying to get back on. Yeah, he's still on Skype. I can see him here in my contacts here. Gotcha. Uh, listen, gentlemen, we are experiencing some technical difficulties. Please hang in there. <laughs> mm-hmm. You gotta just stay strong as 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 these things come through. Yeah, but compared to the problems we had with Mark Berry's interview earlier this earlier last year, this is nothing. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're not experiencing that intensive technical issues. Yeah, I kept getting dropped from Block Talk Radio when I tried calling in. Oh God. A couple times. Uh, I I wasn't a host. Time. How, how difficult was it getting that interview going? I, I wasn't host at the time that happened. It was a pain in the butt, to say the least. Mm. Uh. <laughs> On the technical Good side, or, or what? Like, what was? Well, it was the audio was a problem. Oh. Audio bugs. I am hoping to block talk because Mark didn't have Skype. I'm hoping with uh, with my recording, it ends up being well. Because if, if it ends up being crappy, then this whole time would have been exactly wasted. But I think doing those tests, uh, I think it'll be decent. I, again, I can probably send it through Scott and see if he can edit it, either make yeah, it louder Scott in some areas yeah, or Scott whatever. Can fix, Scott can fix it if need be. Yeah, but hopefully it'll be fixable if there's any issues. I'm hoping there's not, but... He can salvage it. He's very good at this sort of thing, like I mentioned. Well, that's good. Whatever has to be done... Yeah. Thomas, were you able to go with, uh, were you able to kind of oversee Tyler, or check out Tyler's kind of thing last summer for the, uh, mm. what was it, the Shindig, right? Right, yes. Yeah, because I know you, I know you saw Tyler and, oh, Cam's phone, phone oh. is dead. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, looks like, oh, I think he's got it charged. You there, Cam? Yeah, my phone, uh, it, it died. Alright, are you, you have it plugged plug in? in or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Okay. Oh, good, good. Alright, um, we're back. I guess we can, I guess, I guess we can just, uh, continue. You, you were on your second question. Uh, with mine? Yeah, yeah you here. said you had a second question. Uh, I guess my second question would be, um, uh, 
going into museum collections, how would a person or a paleontologist rather catalog, catalog fossils? Ah, oh, yeah. Well, that depends on the particular museum. Um, although there's sort of two general, two general ways of doing it. One would be, and uh, in my if, in my experience, the more common way is taxonomic. Um, that once a particular specimen is identified, uh, at least identified as well as you can, um, and the appropriate protection is there, whether it's just a little box or some more form-fitting thing to preserve the specimen or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that you organize it along major groups. So, you know, dinosaurs are together, and within dinosaurs, ornithischians are one side, and sourceskins are another, and then within it, you've got it organized by various subgroups. Um, and that tends to be the most common way of doing it. And it has the advantage that if you're going to work on, a, I have a specimen and I'm pretty certain it's a new sort of um, a new sort of ornithopod. You know what part of the collections you have to go to and to compare it to all the other ornithopods there. But there's another way of organizing it, and there's a lot of utility to this too, and that's by the particular sites. And so this way all the specimens from, say, the Morrison Formation are together, and each site has its own set of cabinets. Oh, um, yeah. And that way, if you've been working at a particular site, you've got them all together, and if you, for instance, you've got a bone, you can't quite recognize what it is, you've got the other, the potential creatures already discovered there to compare it to. Um, and you can have people who have really good expertise in a particular formation or set of formations and all the creatures in that, even if they don't know the creatures from radically different ages as well. You know, the flip side are people that are know a particular taxon really well, but don't know the other taxa very well. Um, and I've seen both museums use b both approaches. It's my experience it tends to be organized more taxonomically at more museums than the other way, but uh, there's logic to both of them. Yeah, I've seen that the Denver Museum and our kind of collections, you know, they kind of have it organized in, a bit in a hybrid way where they both have it taxonomically mm. in subsets, but mainly it's kind of in an age location thing, you know, uh, mm. um, where I think they start with some of their younger stuff, like some of their Pleistocene, and then further back to some of their, their dinosaurs and turtles and stuff like that, especially turtles, if, I mean, knowing Tyler. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, looks yeah, like... I... Oh. What was that? Oh, never mind. Yeah, go ahead. I, I honestly forgot. I was going to say that Cam was... dropped his yeah, phone again, must have died. Phone. Yeah. Uh, I guess we can continue since he asked his question, so I think, Christopher, you can start on Chris, yours. Time yeah. for you to go up on base and, and swung a home run. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I'll probably go with, uh, what geologic time is the most interesting to you? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I actually am a big late Mastriptian fan. Yeah. And, of course, it goes in with the whole Tyrannosaurus Rex thing. But um, I just really like the Hell Creek fauna. Um, so, you know, in part, it's just been familiar since I've been growing up, you know, because it was already well, well known. So the classic, back when it was Trachodon, you know, uh, Edmontosaurus or Anatosaurus and Ectens, whatever we want to call it, um, and Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and or Torosaurus. Um, and Ankylosaurus and Pachycephalosaurus, you know, though that batch of dinosaurs, people have grown, you know, kids have grown up with them for generations now. Um, but it is it's actually intellectually an interesting thing, too, because this is that apex fauna. It's the fauna immediately before the, um, the extinction. So this is what dinosaurs were doing right before the end. Um, it's, there's a lot of science still getting done in it. Um, you know, we're now working on trying to sort out what changes are happening within the Hell Creek and 
how many of these are local, regional, environmental changes, and what are larger scale changes in the communities. Um, so I just really like the, the, the Hell Creek fauna. Uh, that said, you know, I like them all. Uh, and not strictly just dinosaurian fauna. I like the entire ancient world. There's lots and lots of interesting things that go throughout the history of life. And um, each each time slice has its own intriguing stories. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I guess um, I kind of, I'm kind of a little biased on the Hell Creek formation as well, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of almost getting an interest into like the, the Triassic uh, fauna of like uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Oh, absolutely, that's that's very interesting. Being uh, working kind of, you know, in that area um, as part of my field experience over this. This summer, you know, seeing some of those things is is very interesting. And I was gonna throw my opinion out there. I really do like the Campanian, mostly because of the Gaparowitz, uh, right, sure. you know, the Grand Staircase uh, area. Yeah, I, because of my bias with working at the museum and stuff, and that my favorite dinosaur, Nizzotoceratops, was found there. You know, I have a big bias sure. toward kind of kind of like you and T Rex. You know, I have a big bias towards uh, Campanian, also Mistrici, and uh, still trying to learn these geologic, you know. At epoch sure. names, but um, it's also a favorite of mine. But campaign is ap it has to be uh, my favorite. I would have to say, sure, for those things. Um, Sam, I think it's your turn, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, my next question is. Uh, uh, hang on a second. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, do you believe that a quadrupedal theropod could have existed during the Mesozoic era, or if a, or if non-avian dinosaurs didn't go extinct, could a genus of such a theropod have also evolved? I, I hope I said that right. Sure. I um. In principle, there's nothing to prevent such a thing from happening. Um, after all, you know, we live in a world that produced the hummingbirds and penguins and seahorses and molas. So, you know, a quadrupedal theropod isn't impossible. Uh, that said, we don't have any evidence of any of them. Uh, that di the theropoda remains a group that throughout its history uh, remained obligate bipeds. Um, and we don't see anything like the shifts we see in sauropodomorphs or in thyreophorins or ceratopsians or um, even ornithopods towards quadrupedality. Um, so, but there's nothing that would necessarily have stopped them. Uh, it's just I don't think we have any evidence for it yet. Uh, I, I've always found the idea of, uh, of a quadrupedal theropod to be interesting, and in fact, if you look in the chat box and scroll up a little, you'll uh, see uh, the, uh, an illustration that I had commissioned of a speculative theropod that walks on four legs. I call it quadrosaurus, meaning quadrupedal lizard. Hmm. See it? I'm scrolling up here. Do, 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 do. I posted it around 3.38 p.m. Okay, let's see. It's designed by our friend Jeremy Hurst, aka Saber Rex. Ah. Okay. Yep. Huh. But yeah, I. For people who really, you know, want there to be uh, quadrupedal theropods, you know, you can always go to Ramasukians and uh, get the next best thing. So. Yeah. Um, um, they are certainly theropod-like, and um, they are quadrupeds, and some of them are, um, some of them were quite large. I mean, we get you get into some of the later Rallisuchians, and they are animals, you know, that could have given Megalosaurus a run for its money yeah. in terms of size. So, um, um. They are technically not theropods, but for uh, but for the general public, they might as well be. Yeah. Um. It, it, sorry, if, if I may, uh, just uh, I I have to ask real quick. Uh, we'll, sure. Yeah. 
but personally, what do you think of the uh, the illustration that I had made? I'm I'm sorry, I had to ask that. <laughs> oh sure. Uh, let's see if I can uh, expand that out. Oop. Ah, there it is. Okay, got it. Uh, that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, of course, the question, like we, we talk, as we talked about with Spinosaurus, is how do you transform the forelimb into uh, weight support for um, for a theropod? And in uh, uh, so this approach looks. Uh, basically a knuckle walker, uh, which, you know, gorillas do, chimps do, so we know it is a possible mode of life, even if we haven't seen any evidence of it in theropods. Uh, you know, the solution in, in sauropodomorphs was to eventually uh, pronate the hands, transform the orientation of the, yeah. uh, of the palms, uh, which, you know, you can take a primitive Saurisian arm and do, because sauropodomorphs obviously did that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but you know, so you could have done that theoretically with theropods, too, because we, we haven't seen it happen in their actual history. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, uh, if there was an example, I'd see it more as like a pro-sauropod kind of posture, uh, you know, like with the... With the mid, you know, Cretaceous, or not Cretaceous, what the hell am I talking about, uh, Triassic, you know, what, I, I don't know exactly their range, but, you know, mm. I, I had a feeling if they, you know, if theropods theoretically were to become quadruped, I feel like they'd go the same approach as, uh, uh, prosauropods, in my opinion, but right, I don't know right. enough about that, obviously, and with a lack of evidence. Um, I'm going to ask another question from our question form. It's also from Kiefer Brown. And his question is, he's wondering if you think Tyrannosaurus hunted in packs like uh, Dr. Phil Curry has suggested. Yeah, well, the fact that we have multiple sites where different age individuals were found together is certainly suggestive that they had some sort of group, presumably family groups, that operated together. Um, because you wouldn't, statistically, you wouldn't expect if it was a random sample of the environment to get these things that often, where it's these, you know, a couple of individuals of different sizes of T-Rex and not any other dinosaur uh, together. Um, so it, it's, the question would then be to what degree could they have organized um, in terms of a hunting group. And that's something that, you know, the more we learn about cognition in uh, non-avian reptiles, um, the more I think it's likely that we probably could have had sophisticated behavior in dinosaurs because we're, we're finding that crocodilians, for instance, and, and, and monitor lizards may be more clever than they've been given credit. Um, and those are animals with a smaller brain to body size, you know, scaled for the, for the body size than do typical dinosaurs. So gotcha. if you can have the, there's some suggestion, for instance, of baiting in, um, in crocodilians. The crocodilians may be putting branches and twigs on their noses during the season when some birds are building nests with the intention of the birds coming down there to grab the, the branch so they could then bite. Well, if you could do that with alligator level brain power, then something like uh, Tyrannosaurus, or especially something like, you know, Velociraptor, uh, would have had a lot more sophisticated potential for sophisticated behavior than that. Gotcha. Um, okay. Those were my thoughts exactly. Okay, Dylan, you can ask this one from, uh, from our group member Christopher. Oh, the one I just posted? Yeah, if you'd like to. Okay, yeah, so uh, another question, I'm going to probably butcher his last name, but his name's uh, Christopher uh, Sir... I think it might be Sharka. Sharka. Um, he's a, he's a paleo artist, I know that. His, right, right. his question is, how far and precisely is it possible to trace the radiation of Tyrannosauridae from Guanlon through to T-Rex? Sure. Well, I mean, there's obviously great big gaps in it um, at present. So we got long chunks of that history that we don't have well samples yet. 
But that said, the analyses that people are coming up with have tended to converge on similar answers um, pretty well. So I don't think we're going to find radically new rearrangements of the major groups uh, in the near future. Gotcha. Some of the stuff's going to shift around a little bit here there. Uh, the exact position of D. Long tends to shift around. Um, the um, details of sort of Stokesosaur level, so Stokesosaurus and Jura Tyrant and Eo Tyrannus, those guys sort of shift around. But there are these big gaps, so between the sort of the Proceratosaur Proceratosaur days so of Guan Long and Proceratosaur. Yeah, yeah. Muskets and so forth. To the next branch up, that section is kind of. There are branches in there we're certainly missing. Um, and between sort of the Eo Tyrannus grade and then the Campanian Mastrictian group, mm -hmm. uh, Jean Guan Long goes in there, Timurlengia goes in there, yeah. Electrosaurus may go in there. But none of those are known from really complete material, and that's a real long time gap. So that's one that's going to get filled in eventually. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, those are some of the main places where things are sort of questionable, and also things like Cryptosaurus. Cryptosaurus is so fragmentary that exactly how it fits relative to the others, you know, remains a bit of a question. Although it does seem to be higher up in the tree than we might have used to think when, you know, new work by Rosati and Carr looking at the details of the anatomy showed yeah, that, yes, yeah. it probably did have an arctometatarsis and so forth. So it probably is close to the Apolactosaurus, Electrosaurus, uh, and more derived part of the tree. Now, the, gotcha. the, big, the big question in Tyrannosauroid phylogeny would be, do Megaraptorids fit in there? And yeah, yeah. I, I am not convinced that they belong in there. I would not be tremendously surprised if they fall in there. Gotcha, yeah. Um, they are a complicated group to work with, but they definitely do have some basal Silurosaur traits that could put them in the right general part of the tree. Um... And, you know, we only get them by the early Cretaceous, so we don't know what their earlier phases looked like. Yeah. So it's not at all inconceivable that they might wind up in there. In fact, there had been a period of time when um, I was wondering if Eutyrannus might have wound up being a Megaraptorid. Now that we know a little bit more about Megaraptorid anatomy and about Eutyrannus anatomy, and I don't think it's super likely, but it wasn't... It wouldn't take too much to transform one of those into the other. Yeah, so, yeah. So that, I think, is the... Currently, the biggest question mark in Tyrannosauroid phylogeny is do Megaraptorids belong in there or not? It's interesting how you state about uh, Tyrannus possibly being part of the Megaraptorids. I mean, is, is it... Evidence for it may not be strong. I think the thought of it is just very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And part of the part of the reason that was in my mind is the Eutyrannus material and the Megaraptorids as Tyrannosauroids both came out around the same time, and in fact, I had to let the, let the two different teams know independently uh, of that possibility because they weren't yeah. aware of the other work. So uh, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Well, that's interesting. Have to read more right, into that. Right. Um, I guess we're trying to figure out our next question. Sure. Um, yeah, this is the one that got asked a lot. Yeah, we're trying about to fe about feathers on Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, we can't. We can't credit those, a book. We we can't. Including oh. even other large theropods outside of Eutyrannus. Uh, yeah. Tyrannosaurus Rex. Etc. Bunch of people oh. asked the can't really go back and see all the people who asked that, but that was, as Greg said, one of the most, if not the most common question received for this the interview. Very best, the very best one to ask. Guys. 
Right. But this T-Rex itself, we can use Sam's question here. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. most likely. Yeah, yeah uh, so we'll, we'll, we can start with T-Rex itself, and we can say is, what we can say is we do not yet directly observe it on Tyrannosaurus, and there are a small number of patches of scales that are known from Tyrannosaurus, but that's all we can actually say with confidence. Because, as I said before, we have zero skin impressions of a titanotheum. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we're justified in making them entirely hairless. Yeah. Um, so we know that Tyrannosaurids are nested among a clade of fuzzy dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, so we got you, Tyrannus, we've got DeLong, and then outside that we get Thompsonathids and um, other actual feathery dinosaurs like Ornithomimids and, and, um, and Peribians. Um, so Tyrannosaurids are definitely nested among known fuzzy creatures. To what degree they had fuzz over the body and to what degree that might have changed onto genetically, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. We can't say one way or the other. We know they're the descendants of fuzzy creatures. Um, we can eliminate the presence of fuzz on a small patch here and there on the body, but that doesn't mean the rest of the body didn't have something else on it. Um, so we honestly have to say question mark. You know, to say they had lost all traces of fuzz is to infer an evolutionary change for which we don't have evidence. And it is exactly analogous to claiming that we'll find a Tyrannosaur id with three fingers. Yeah. It is theoretically possible, <laughs> but it is they are nested among a group where we know there's a transformation to a different state. So to have them revert entirely to the ancestral state, uh, we don't have any positive evidence for it. It is theoretically possible. We don't have direct evidence for it. Yeah. Well, before we get on to our next question, um, sure. I want to I add an add-on question to that. One thing I always hear people who are always pro-feathers is using Coulodromius, I think, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's kind of like a ba yeah, yeah. kind of a basal. I don't, I don't know. And again, I don't know if I'm using this term correctly because I'm still trying to learn my scientific Latin names. Sure. But they like to use Coulodromia since it's so far back, you know, in the Triassic or wherever, you know, whenever it was. I, I don't remember the age, but they use it as kind of a basal for almost dinosauria. So it's they kind of use it as a reference to say, you know, at least some dinosaurs we know of are feathered, if not almost a bunch of them. So I wondered what your thoughts were on people using Coulodromius to justify that the possibility of all dinosaurs might have been feathered. Right. Yeah, it's, it is an intriguing right. question because um, so we now have fuzz, we could definitely put fuzzy integument up in Solorosauria. Yeah. If Juravenator and or Sirenemus are megalosauroids, which some analyses have them come out as, then then we could say, okay, maybe this is actually a tetanurine trait. Um, and then we go down to a bunch of question marks. We can't say yeah. one way or the other. The only thing down in that part of the tree beyond that, we have Carnotaurus doesn't have fun. That yeah, yeah, fun. skin impressions um, found in that one. Yeah. There's yet, as yet present, no evidence of fuzz in any sort of potomorph. And at least juvenile titanosaurids were scaly over much of the body, and there are some other patches of scales in, in other sauropodomorphs, but nothing like a good skin impression anywhere in there. And sadly, nothing from an early sauropodomorph at all. Gotcha. Uh, so we start going up the next side of the tree, and that's when it gets complicated. So I wish we had never found these guys. No, I don't wish we had never found them. But <laughs> Tian Yu Long is a heterodontosaurid, and heterodontosaurids are some of the most basal ornithischians, and they have fuzz. Yeah. And then we go up, and we find Calidodromius, so a basal neornithischian, 
and it's got fuzz, and it's got these weird things that nothing else has, and it's got complex things, and it's got scales, and it's got all sorts of stuff. Um, if what Xian Yu Long and Kalinda Dromius have is homologous, that it represents the same evolutionary event yeah, yeah. as what's in theropods, then that would mean that trait evolved at the base of Dinosauria. Unfortunately, right now, that is equally parsimonious with it being independently derived. Yeah, it's yeah. It's not better, it's not worse. It's at the state where, because we don't have what basal sauropodomorphs have, or really basal theropods, we can't connect the two yet. And then we get even more complicated because we have no skin impressions on Silosaurids or Marasuchus, Allogerpatids, and the next time we pick up the skin of anything, it's pterosaurs and they're fuzzy. Yeah. yeah. And so there's the non-zero chance, we cannot eliminate this chance that the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs were fuzzy. Yeah. Um, which is consistent with certain aspects of their common ancestry, like the rapid growth rates uh, and um, a small body size initially and so forth. But there are enough question marks in between that it wouldn't take many observations to say, no, it's, in, it's actually independent. So we're sort of in a state of flux right now where yeah. uh, it is difficult to strongly argue the case one way or another. I will say the strangest thing I've seen, and it's something that I would not say is justified, at least not yet, yeah. is there's a, a new exhibit, actually it's just shutting down like this, next, this week or next week or something like that, soon in any case, at the American Museum on bird origins. Oh yeah, and that one. Buzz on a, on a Pseudosuchia. Okay. And that I would say we got zero evidence for, and that's speaking beyond the data. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's they're just being crazy there. Uh, Speculation overdrive. For now, you know, we could do evidence maybe can point us in that direction, but for now, no. Um, gotcha. So, um, uh, but yeah, so the question of whether fuzz was present at the base of dinosauria, and if so, to what degree was it present on the animals? Because it's not like they're mutually exclusive. We absolutely know from modern birds and Calindodromius and Juravenator that you have scales and feathers and other stuff on the animal at the same time. So what might be present at the base of Dinosauria or the base of one of the Dira is the ability to generate this stuff. And gotcha. whether that's generated on a, as a mane or just some quills or a full fuzzy body covering depends on your ecology. So, Gotcha. Uh, that does help a lot. Yeah. So, are you going to read off some questions, Greg, that you posted here? All right, I'm trying to see where to start here. If we if we cover the feather dinosaur thing fairly enough, we're ready to move on to this guy who you were getting the questions from. Sure. All right, his next, his first question was, due to the constant change in the cladistic system and phylogenetic placement of the extinct animals, dinosaurs in particular, is there a possibility, in your opinion, that the discovery of Chiloiosaurus could potentially affect the phylogenetic placement of Tyrannosaurus in the system? Can this possibly shed a new light on how Tyrannosaurus really evolved and perhaps propose newer and different placements? Yes, no, maybe, and why? Okay, so multiple things. Dinosaur phylogeny is super stable. If you think that it's unstable, you have not been looking at the phylogenies of other groups of animals. Yeah. If you want to see instability, try something like placental mammals. <laughs> there you'll see instability. So there are minor tweaks here and there in dinosaur phylogeny, but by and large, there haven't been major huge revisions <sighs> for, for a long time. There's been revisions. I mean, like... Basal, what used to be basal ornithopods have moved down to basal neornithiscians. But that all, all that means is that marginosophalia has moved up basically a node or two. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think, you know, Chilisaurus itself is unlikely to be stabilized 
much of the rest of theropod phylogeny. The question is, where is Chilesaurus going to fit, and is it really a theropod? I think it is. I think it's just highly convergent on some other groups. But, you know, it could almost be a really derived prosauropod. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's what it is, but that wouldn't be super crazy, and that'd be more likely than it destabilizing, say, the position of Tyrannosaurids. Yeah. Um, that Chilesaurus is, is a rather peculiar looking little animal, um, but it's the new character states it's introducing have very little bearing on the distribution of the states that put Tyrannosaurids as basal Solarosaurus. Gotcha. That's interesting. Though. Okay, the next the question number three here. Is there any way to predict the likelihood of finding a Tyrannosaurid mummy? Um, I would. I don't know that we'd be able to count to predict the likelihood as in give a percentage chance or something. I would say it's absolutely not crazy um, because we have some mummies in the Hell Creek already. There are Edmontosaurus mummies that have been found in the Hell Creek. It's the same assemblage with Tyrannosaurus, so there's nothing to prevent it, a Tyrannosaur from being found in the same general setting. Uh, mummies, though, have been less good in getting the integument, although they're still good, they're still really good than the ones found in lake deposits. Lake deposits have really given us the more of the soft tissue and the firm tissue structure, um, even if we don't get the 3D details that we can in a mummy. Um, so, and that is somewhat less likely because people haven't really found a lot of good lake deposits for the late Cretaceous of Western North America. Uh, it's more a lot more of the fluvial, the stream systems and the overbank deposits and so forth that have been found. And those might be good at preserving mummies, but not so much in preserving the fine details of, of feathers and so forth. That's it. Okay. It's not, not crazy. So. That makes sense. And this guy's last question is, is there a way to tell how often Tyrannosaurus and Therabots in general have replaced their teeth during their lifetime? Uh, yes, there is. Um, and in fact, um, you could get a PhD doing it, only Greg Erickson did that uh, back in the 1990s. So, um, <clears throat> nothing to threaten someone from doing it again. But yeah, so a lot of the, um, um, when you look at the, um, the histological section, the microscopic histological section of a vertebrate tooth, there are these lines that are produced during growth, and they're sort of daily lines. Um, they're sort of like lags, only they're daily rather than, than, than annual. Um, because of that, you could see how long it took to grow an individual tooth. Um, and people have used those as sort of a starting point at calculating the rate of replacement. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I believe Erickson uh, calculated the Tyrannosaurus had sort of a low rate of replacement with maybe like a year or so for each tooth. Um, in contrast, things like Ceratopsids and Hadrosaurids and some of the sauropods are regenerating new teeth every month, uh, every two months to one month or something like that. Um, so they're burning through teeth a lot more quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Dylan, you're up next. All right, so this is a little bit more of a personal question than a logistical one. Uh, sure. What's your favorite memory from the field, any of your field expeditions? Ah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, I can think of two of them. Uh, okay. One was early on, uh, and it was when I was... Um, um, a graduate student, and we were working in the Matizzi Formation, so it's a campaign of, uh, of Wyoming. Okay. And uh, we were sitting down uh, and sort of trying to get the, just look out at the lay of the land and figure out where we're going to go, and I looked to my side, and there was a bit of dinosaur eggshell. Ooh, interesting. Um, so there wasn't anything like a good preserved nest, but there definitely was eggshell at that site. 
And so that was kind of cool to recognize me. You know, we were sitting where. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because eggshell doesn't transport very well at all, so it couldn't have been transported very far from the initial site. Um, the other was it would have been more recently. Uh, that was when we were working. The first year we were collecting uh, pearl, which is a specimen of Ansu, this Oviraptor. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. In uh, they were collecting in Montana, and earlier some people on the team had found bits and pieces of a theropod at a site. So we were working our way into the hill, and I saw a sort of a um, circuit, oval of flat surface of bone in there, which at first I thought might have been the end, the articular surface, the end oh, of yeah, the yeah. rock. And so I began to, to dig around it, and this particular level, there were a lot of, of um, roots of plants. Among yeah, them, yeah, I know what you're there, talking about. Which in the fur was really bad because, in yeah. particularly, it had to be an oviraptorosaur. They, they have such hollow vertebrae that oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. Got in there, they blew the stuff away. But when it's on the outside of some bones, it actually is pretty useful because it begins to separate them from the sediment. Yeah, yeah. And so I was worried that this was a vertebra and that it was just going to crumble, and it began to move. I was, oh my god. But then it came out as one piece. And oh, it was that, that's luck. You're lucky right there. <laughs> exactly. So we're like, oh my god, and it was the toe that allowed us to recognize that it was actually an Anzu. And oh, so nice. First in that in that dig, we got in and up, so we saw the metatarsals. Oh, it's cool. Uh, An Oviraptorosaur. Um, but and so if you go to my personal page on uh, at the university site, there's a picture of me holding up that toe, Ooh. and that's the very that is that very toe. I'll have to and look so at I'm that. So yeah. About that, because I thought it was going to be a disaster, and it was going to be a bone crumbling in my hand. And <laughs> yeah. It out, a, to be really well preserved, and B, it was sort of the key to figuring out what it was we had. Yeah, I've I've uh, prepped uh, some specimens from the Caparawas, mm. and you know it's the same age as Companion, and they kind of have that same root, some of the fossils have that same root thing in it, so yeah. I totally understand what you mean, and, you know, we're trying to, you know, in some cases where it completely just separates the bone kind of from the matrix yes. area, but <laughs> well, the, I, I could just kind of imagine myself in your situation where the bone pulls out, and I'm sure for a split second you were almost going to have a, like, a serious heart attack, oh, especially yeah. if it was a vertebra of, of a... Anzu, you know, as, as you described yeah. it as being very hollow, and I'm sure if it was, the roots probably would have gone inside the hollow section, so that's oh, a good, I, I like that story, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for answering that, that's, yeah. that's some interesting stories. So, Sam, you have right. two questions. Oh, oh yeah, uh, sorry about that. Uh, You're good. Um, my next question is, uh, uh, did Tyrannosaurs, such as Tyrannosaurus Rex, sometimes choke on bones that they swallowed since they didn't actually chew what they ate? Um, well, as it turns out, Tyrannosaurus is, and the Tyrannosaurids were some of the few, some of the few theropods we do know chewed what they ate. Oh, um, and we know mm. that from, um, from T-Rex coprolites. Mm. Um, so there's um, a famous T-Rex coprolite from Saskatchewan. It's about a two-liter, so about the size of a two-liter bottle. And in it are the smashed bones of juvenile ornithischians. And it looks like that, in fact, they were able to crush the bones, at least the smaller bones, of the creatures they were feeding on. So. Um, at least some of the time, they could have munched down the the bones so that they were smaller and they wouldn't necessarily have to worry about choking on it. That said, uh, almost certainly they probably gulped down a lot of stuff too, and so they would have risked choking just like everything does. Um, we haven't yet found any specimens that show it, but over the course of you know 15 million years of Tyrannos of evolution in Tyrannosauridae. There had to have been some cases where, by accident, you know, they they got a ceratopsid horn core caught in the <laughs> wrong direction, and uh, much to their uh, their detriment. So. Yeah, but same. Before you ask your next question, I want to kind of ask a sub question. Something that's always bothered me is sometimes how 
scientists are somewhat able to kind of understand like a certain species of animal for their copper lights and like right. as you mentioned how 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 does that how how do people do that and like say like if they look at a copper light i mean besides the bones you know you could say it could be a tyrannosaur but what makes you think it's like specifically tyrannosaurus right. rex that's something that always bothered me a little bit Sure, sure, and I'm going to use Karen Chin's joke about this, because Karen Chin has okay. all the great, greatest copper light jokes. You work it out by process of elimination. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that, that is technically true. Yeah. So, uh, That's has, perfect. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, she's got a lot of great copper lights. I have kind of a better analogy myself. Yeah, so in the, the particular specimen is from the Frenchman Formation, which is the Hell Creek equivalent. In, in Saskatchewan. Yeah. So, in that formation, the creatures that we know of that are car carnivores are Tyrannosaurus rex, and then the other Hell Creek fauna. Now, we don't know, we didn't know about Dakota Raptor when this particular thing was found, but even Dakota Raptor would be unlikely to produce it. Yeah, yeah, I understand and, that. And something like, you know, uh, Atrocia Raptor, Anzu, or something like that would be the next uh, sort of the next size theropylons who's not going to be crushing uh, bones. So what we have is a two-liter coprolite from a terrestrial carnivore. Um, so either it could be Tyrannosaurus rex, which is known for that formation, gotcha. or a, a creature that has that produces those sized coprolites for which we have no other evidence. And so by parsimony, the simpler explanation is it's a creature we already know that could have, that's consistent with producing these copper lights. Um, if, however, you were to find a copper light like that in the Dinosaur Park formation or the Horseshoe Canyon or something like that, where we've got multiple Tyrannosaurids, then we wouldn't be able to choose between them. We might yeah, yeah, that's, that's what my thought process was. It's right. sometimes so, how scientists are able to... to the guess, like, oh, it's Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, but, but right. like, you know, in, in the situation with Hell Creek, uh, you know, with with there being really one known Tyrannosaur like that, you know, that can crush bone in, in a sense with the copper lights, I guess that makes sense. Right. So, yeah, similarly, if you found a, say, a one liter copper light in, uh, for a carnivore in the Morrison we wouldn't have a clue whether yeah. it's Allosaurus or Torvosaurus or Ceratosaurus or whatever, um, that any of them could have been the producers. Gotcha. Thanks. That answers, yeah, that answers my question. So I'll let Sam get to his second question. Yeah, I, 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 I think this one is actually my, my final question, I think. Hmm. Uh, is it possible that there were uh, dinosaurs that burrowed underground and lived at least somewhat subterranean lifestyle? Do you think that's at all possible? Um, the burrowing underground is looking pretty clear that some of them did. In particular, um, a branch of the uh, Parxosaurids, what we used to sort of more generally call Hypsilophodonts, um, called the Orodromines. Uh, so Orodromius um, uh, um, has been found, not Orodromius itself, um, mind is blanking as to which Orodromian it is, um, that we do have some of these guys already found, I'll get this up in a moment, um, in burrows with juveniles, um, so we know that some of them did dig into the underground to produce a place, but whether they spent much time in there, at least as much time as adults, seems less likely because no dinosaur has sort of that general fossorial build. So most animals that spend a lot of time in burrows wind up being sausage shaped. Uh, whether it's a fat sausage or a long sausage or whatever. So if you think about it, you know, ferrets or um, rabbits, which are sausages with long ears and legs, um, or um, badgers or moles or whatever, they tend to converge on sort of that general pattern. And there's no evidence of a dinosaur with sort of that 
look. Um, so that um, we do have evidence that dinosaurs did dig into the ground. Uh, that maybe as babies they might have spent some time there, but they probably didn't spend huge amounts of time there. And now let's see. Do do do. Or uh, Oryctodromius. There we go. Oryctodromius. Of course, uh, burrowing runner. Um, and there, in fact, are what are probably Oryctodromine burrows, or something that look like them, in other countries as well. So we've got them in Western North America, but there's sites in Korea and in Australia that may also be uh, di small dinosaur burrows. But also, they tend to be small dinosaurs too. Thank you very much. All right, Chris, you're up next. <clears throat> All right, uh, I'll get I'll get one, and then uh, later on I'll get the rest of mine. Um, I'll actually get to uh, the my media question here. Is uh, what's your favorite dinosaur movie? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, that's a good one. Um. You know, it's a cliche, but, you know, Jurassic Park is still a good movie. It's not a great movie, but it's a good movie, and you can watch it again and again. Um, Same thoughts. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. Kong, the original King Kong is a fun movie, too, and the first half of it is a dinosaur movie. Um, but, yeah, and it's... You know, if if we if we restrict di dinosaur movies to things that are specifically actually supposed to be dinosaurs and not sort of more general kaiju, uh, then yes, yeah, so I would say it probably would be probably would still be Jurassic Park. Yeah, I can't go wrong anything with that. With, anything with gay crotch gray hairy owls in the movie, for example. Right. right. And Guanji is a good, you know, fun movie. Um, One million years BC. Yeah, yeah. When when dinosaurs ruled the earth. Yes. Where okay. it's in which of the two? I think it's one million years BC. Where, despite the fact that the the cavemen do not otherwise speak English, they know the proper name for giant protostegid <laughs> uh, turtles. Because as the turtle comes going over the edge of the sand dune, one of the cavemen points and goes, "Archelon, Archelon." <laughs> so they know what you know, Granger or whoever named it, Williston. Well, Williston was going to name it, you know, in the early, in the late 19th century, so, uh... Yeah, yeah, because, um, I kind of actually love the Harry Housen movies. Jurassic Park is a good one as well. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, uh, kind of actually, when I, I did a report, uh, one time for one of my classes, uh, for, um, the 1925 silent film, The Lost World. Yeah. I that I thought that was a fantastic movie. I, even though there's no words in it, but hey, it's right. it's uh, it's it's a great movie. Yeah, it is. It is very good. People at the time thought those were actually real dinosaurs you're seeing on screen because of the groundbreaking effects work of Willis O'Brien. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I I don't know who it was exactly. I I I think it may have been Arthur Conan Doyle or someone, but somebody implied that the footage in, in that movie was actual documentary footage. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a Conan Doyle thing to have done, so. <laughs> okay, who wants to go up next? Um, did I, did I say I was going after Chris, or was did Cam have any questions, or... Uh, I think oh. Cam has some questions, too, or something. Or if if his sig his signals may be off. Um. Okay. I can answer. I can ask Kiefer's questions. Kiefer's last round of questions here. Okay, sounds Cam good. This thing worked. All right. His first question is: What factors do you believe led to gigantism in tyrannosaurs? Ah. Yeah. So. It looks like, and unfortunately, this. This time period, late Cenomanian through the Santonian, so the early part of the late Cretaceous of Western North America and Central Asia, where we don't have a lot of good dig sites yet. Um, something happens in that interval um, where we lose the Carcharodontosaurids and 
any other large theropod. And it looks like the gigantism in tyrannosaurids is, in a, res is a response to that. With having the, the previous dinosaurs that occupies those niche gone, and they sort of rise to the challenge to occupy that niche, um, you know, presumably the other option would have been for the dromaeosaurids to fill in that gap. And, and honestly, you see in, in the case of, of Asia, you know, a Troshi raptor is almost, you know, heading in that direction. You know, it's Utah raptor size or almost that, uh, but they didn't quite get that far. Um, so tyrannosaurs sort of rise to fill in this gap that had been uncapped at the top. And to be fair, you know, the early, up until you get Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus and Jucheng Tyrannus, they're still smaller than some of the big Carcharodontosaurids. So, you know, Displetosaurus is a big dinosaur, but it's not big compared to a Giganotosaurus or a Mapusaurus or something, um, or to Tyrannosaurus. That, um, that, um, and so at that point, so I think what happens then is you've got, you've got sort of the arms race going on. So bigger Tyrannosaurids result in bigger Ceratopsids and Hadrosaurids, which result in bigger Tyrannosaurids, which result in bigger Ceratopsids and Hadrosaurids. And it's probably not a coincidence that the largest representatives um, tend to co-occur with each other. So the largest, you know, Shangtungasaurus and its various synonyms with with Juchen Tyrannus and um, Triceratops and Taurosaurus um, with with Tyrannosaurus Rex, so. Okay, here we got, we got two more from him, they're about sauropods. Okay. This first one being, sauropods always depicted to ban their young akin to modern sea turtles. However, do you think this could be an overgeneralization of sauropod that some species may have provided various levels of parental care? And the part two to this is something else entirely. The discovery of a trackway in the Morris formations led to the hypothesis that sauropod hatchlings were vacuated biped. Is this accurate, or this could just be a result of erosion of the trackway? Ah, yeah. So, um, the first one, first, is I've never really bought the argument that sauropods abandoned their young. Uh, and I think that is a, a medium that's, that sort of comes out of walking with dinosaurs, um, or as the last remnant of the idea that all dinosaurs abandoned their young, which before the 1970s had been what everyone had assumed. Um, and I think people say, well, look how different in size the adults and the babies are. And yes, there's like no bigger size gap among terrestrial vertebrates than that. But there's still a tremendous size gap between baby crocodilians and their parents. And yet we see in alligators and crocodiles and gavials, the parents taking care of little bitty babies. There's like, you know, good example photographs of you know, a gavial going around with a whole bunch of babies like sitting on top of its head or swimming around it. Um, so just because there's a great size differential, I don't think automatically precludes any sort of parental care. Uh, although I admit, yeah, it's going to be logistically challenging and they're probably going to lose some babies just by accident, you know, by stepping on. Um, as for the tracks, um, I would say the, given that a lot of sauropods have sort of, and particularly because it's the Morrisons, and these might well be diplodocids, are sort of rear wheel heavy. Uh, the hind limbs are much better developed than the front limbs. That it may be that the hind limbs are giving more impression than the front limbs, so we're not seeing very much impression. And are we actually certain we're seeing the actual footprint layer? and not under tracks, because uh, an impression can press through from the layer that the footprint's actually on to the lower layers of sediment that haven't lithified yet. And if the hand impressions were weak on the upper layer, they might not make it down to the lower layers to the same degree that the hind prints are. Um, I wouldn't be super surprised of baby facultative bipedal uh, diplodocids, given the difference between the forelimb and hindlimb proportions, but uh, I don't think they'd be regularly moving around like that. Um, I want to add to that, but uh, Cam oh. just let me know that uh, 
what the weather over on his end is really bad so he has to unfortunately drop his end of the call so we'll have to okay we'll have to do that um just do that right now um one thing i can add to i can add to that because at the morrissey museum we actually have what we supposedly think are the the footprints from that in fact where we have a partial footprint of what they believe to be an adult adult and then they have the little ones that are around so i've seen those kind of footprints and right obviously not being you know an expert on these things i i personally believe that it's kind of uh plausible for sure you know that the right. f from what i've seen on the footprints especially the younger ones they kind of have a a little bit of defined uh shape to them because you know the the hind feet you know have the the claw i think at the the back if i'm not not mistaken and then you know that you can kind of see that shape where you've got the circle and kind of the 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 claw shape in the in the in the sediment now i can't say for sure obviously not being an expert not knowing enough that it is true or not like you can but i'm saying i think personally it's it's pl plausible but i have seen these uh um, sure i have seen these uh footprints myself so i can kind of attain to that hmm. Gotcha. Okay, I think we should let Chris finish up his remaining question because he has to get going soon. Sounds mm. good. Okay. Yeah. All right, Chris, um, you get the. All right, Chris, time to wrap your end of the bargain. <laughs> yeah, I'll actually give you two more questions. Um, I'll actually ask. Um, <clears throat> uh, what what Tyrannosaurus Rex specimen is the most impressive to you? Ooh. <laughs> well, <laughs> excuse me. It's a cliche, but I think Sue is still. Uh, really impressive, both from the combination of the size of the specimen and its completeness. That there's just so much detail in there, and it is a really impressively large individual. So, okay, yeah, and um, <clears throat> and I would probably my last question uh -huh. um, would actually be, uh, what theropods or other dinosaurs in particular do you think need some more recognition to the public? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, that is good. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, lots of them. I mean, um, whew, it's oh, there's almost like too many. But I'll yeah. just sort of think of oh, sort of march up the tree. So, um, prosauropods in general. Um, Titanosaurs are getting a little more understanding now, but uh, still, there's a lot of diversity there that people don't appreciate. Uh, Ribachisaurids. Um, let's see, over on the theropod side, you know, Ceratosaurus should get more attention. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Megaraptorans. Um, let's see. Alvarosaurids, you know, that's because they're so different from what most people think of when they think of dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. On the Ornithischian side, well, most Ornithischians, the public doesn't know. I mean, the public knows Triceratops, uh, and they know Stegosaurus, and they might know of Ankylosaurs in general. And they'll know about duckbills in some form or other. Yeah. But that basically is all the rest of Ornithischia <laughs> that people don't know about. So, you know, Iguanodon, you know, only the first named Ornithischian. Uh, and yet, a lot of people aren't really aware of it in the public. That's interesting. Um, or, you know, how ankylosaurids are different from each other. They're not all the same thing. Yeah. Or, um, you know, little ones like Escalosaurus. Um, or heterodontosaurs. So yeah, there's just a whole bunch of the diversity of dinosaurs that the public doesn't appreciate because they haven't really been introduced to them. Yeah, for okay. sure, I agree. All right, very good. Thank you. And uh, sorry, I have to take off. Uh, That's fine. This soon, guys. Sure. But uh, yeah, it's all understandable. Good. I I appreciate talking to you, uh, Dr. Holtz, and uh, hopefully I get to talk to you a little bit more on Facebook sometime soon. So. For sure. Sounds good. Well, right. nice uh, hearing later, from guys. you, Chris. See you. See you later, Chris. I'll I'll answer I'll ask his remaining questions. That's all right for you guys. That's fine. Okay. All right. All right. One of his questions is what makes Tyrannosaurus in particular interesting to you for study? Sure. Well, uh, when 
when I was getting started, there were actually very few people doing dinos uh, doing uh, tyrannosaurids, uh, mm. which is hard to believe now. Yeah, you know, lots of people do them. Um, but they are, um, first of all, in the case of Tyrannosaurus rex, it does represent an extreme, uh, so an extreme in size and adaptation, and so that's always an interesting to thing to see. You know, how far can evolution go? Uh, they are peculiar. They aren't a lot like other theropods. I mean, their teeth are very thick from side to side. They've got the expanded back of the head. They've got their weird arms and their weird legs and their weird feet that people don't appreciate because we know the name, and so we assume that they're normal. And I used to say that had tyrannosaurids been discovered in the 1980s, we would think they're, they're weird, bizarre dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. But because they were discovered at the turn of the last century, we're just so used to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of data there. You know, we've got many good skeletons of multiple taxa, which makes it easier to study the details and say even like a Balisaurids, where we've got only a couple of good skeletons of any of the species and then a bunch of fragments of the rest. Um, or Allosaurids, where basically we've got a couple species with, you know, well, there's the same sort of thing. Oh, a couple species with good skeletons and then not much of anything else. Um, so, um, so we get a better sense of what the group is like as a whole, as well as the individual um, taxa, so how they differ and how they're, they're common. I want to ask a kind of mini question before we sure. go along. So when you mentioned the whole uh, serration thing, does that theory about, you know, tyrannosaurs, you know, hold, you know, as they eat, kind of have those uh, flesh lodge in their their teeth. Is that still a valid theory, or or has yeah. that been proven? There's new evidence showing that those um, those structures of the ampullae probably did not evolve for that reason, and they actually are the way their serrations form are different than the way we get serrations forming in in varanids, yeah. which was the model people had before. Um, so they probably didn't evolve in the context to hold the little pockets of decaying flesh. Um, that said, a bite from a theropod probably would not have been that clean of a bite anyway. Yeah, yeah. Even no, if it didn't no kidding. evolve in that context, it's going to be hard for it not to collect little bits of goo in there, and that's just going to make it more septic in terms of the bite. But I think the idea that it evolved in the context of producing uh, a septic bite is unlikely. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, not so much necessarily its its sole purpose or its main purpose, right. but more like I, I, I remember from uh, you know the the Jurassic Fight Club when they talked all about that. Do you think it would be more septic than like just a, you know other theropods or carnivores or not? Yeah, I don't think I think I don't think there's any particular theropod that would have been worse than another one in general. That most of them have serrations that are quite similar to each other, and so they're just as likely to gotcha. get you in there. Additionally, the model that people have been using um, were. Uh, were monitor lizards, and it turns out, although the monitor lizards might have a lot of goo in their mouth, that what people, what some people have been thinking had been a septic bite before, is actually slightly venomous. Interesting. That it out okay. That monitors, that in fact, more types of lizards have a mild venom in them than people used to appreciate. Because the old story was the only lizards that had a venomous bite were Gila monsters and and uh, beaded uh, lizards. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Um, which is true. They're the only ones that have a, a significantly venomous bite. But it turns out that a, a sizable section of the lizard part of the tree, um, or part of the lizard tree, has um, some degree of, of venom, although not enough to really incapacitate prey. Gotcha. Um, okay. That's interesting. I'll, I'll let Greg uh, read the rest mm -hmm. of Christopher's questions, but that was something I wanted to clarify. Okay. All right, the last two are, how many clades did you make over your career as a paleontologist? And following up on that, have you been out in the field recently finding fossils? Um, second part first, I've 
Uh, in terms of looking for dinosaur fossils, I tend to go every summer. Uh, mostly I dig with the Burpee Museum out in southeastern Montana, um, but uh, Carter County. Um, as for the first one, clades that, was it clades that I've named? Or was it clades that I've worked on? Or that you've actually named yourself? That I've named myself. Let's see. Well, um, many raptoriformes and you many raptora um and well arctomenotarsalia but that doesn't really represent much anymore and bulanosauria same thing um let's see there was one that i had proposed a name of but a chapter had to get pulled because the book was taking forever so i haven't got that name out there in public yet um let's see the Eusoriskia was a name I came up with. Um, those, I think, would be the ones that have been out there for now. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah, those would be the, the ones that I've named. So, yeah. And then some that I've, I've sort of helped revive, although the names may have existed before. So, Coelophysoidia um, and Tyrannosauroidia. Those names had technically been proposed before, but oh, and, and Dilophosauridae, uh, but I helped oh, gotcha. like, get them back into circulation. Interesting. Okay. Not a, that's a pretty good resume there. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the next couple of questions. They're going to be from several people from the uh, comment section. So this one is uh, from Jeremy Hurst. I think that's mm. how you say his name. His question is: Does do you argue that the possible theory? A Tyrannosaurus being an invasive species from Asia that might have helped drive native Tyrannosaurus extinct as I know I don't know how to pronounce his last name but I obviously know he is uh, Steve Rossetti and Thomas Carr have suggested I, I I hope I said or pronounced Steve's last name right right yeah. um, so um, yeah the Rossetti and Carr idea well to call him um, I do think and I've been, I've been arguing this actually quite early back in two, uh, 2000 2001, that Tyrannosaurus rex probably is an Asian-derived animal from something like Tarvosaurus, closer to Tarvosaurus, and now we know Shichen Tyrannus as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so it quite likely did come over from Asia, so that much seems to be true. Whether it's responsible for the disappearance of Albertosaurus um, and Albertosaurians in general, though, is a much more questionable thing and we really don't have rocks sampling that interval, the sort of mid-Mastriptian, uh, where that interchange would have occurred to really test that. Gotcha. Um, and so, although it might be possible, you know, we also, throughout the history of life, we'll get these turn well, turnover pulses, as they're called, that they're in intervals of often of environmental change, not big ones, not big enough to be mass extinction events, but change where at that time you get migrations and extinctions and speciations occurring together because the, the habitats shift in concert and those are the different sort of responses. Gotcha. So it could have been a case where the environment shifted in such a way that the Albertosaurines died out, or it could be that the that Tyrannosaurus comes over and ate them. Yeah. So uh, that's either one remains uh, a possibility right now. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good answer for that. Um, we have another question from, uh, his name is Larry Bush. He asks, uh, the newer skull from the specimen Samson is supposedly nearly undisorted, and he wonders if there, that brings any new insights on the species due to this. Yes, it is nearly undistorted. Yes, it does actually bring insight to it, but oh, unfortunately, nice. that specimen is not currently in collections where we can actually get that material described oh. and, uh, and out there. So I've studied the skull when it was actually being prepared at the at the Carnegie Museum. Okay. And it's wonderful. It's got some really cool features in it. When we get to talk about those details yeah. uh, in, in more detail, it will add some new information. It's not going to overturn everything we know. Or no, like of course, we'll bring we'll, some new insight. It will new information. I will say it is a size and it is a growth stage that is not well represented by any other good skulls. So it represents something intermediate between the dueling dinosaurs slash 
a Manarch Tyrannosize, and the classic skulls like AMH 5027 or Stan or Sue. Or yeah, like yeah, I understand. I, I guess I want to add a question to that. Why, why is that? Um, why, why is it not available for really study main? Right, it's a privately owned specimen, and the owner of the specimen hasn't made a final agreement with a particular museum for which it would be accessioned and therefore available to scientists. So until it's it's formally in something where they can say, okay, now you're allowed to study it and publish it, then we have to respect the wishes of the owner yeah. of the specimen. Um, and currently they just don't want uh, anyone really talking about it until that's settled. Yeah, so, yeah, I understand that, because yeah. I, I, I may be mistaking it for another Tyrannosaur, but I remember a year or two ago there was one at a, a, a specimen that was... Uh, put on display at a museum I can't exactly remember and there was a big buzz about it I don't know I, I thought that was Samson um, but I may be mixing it up for another Tyrannosaurid um, which I thought was on display yeah Samson was put on display temporarily um, oh, okay and unfortunately it was it was on display so it wasn't down in you know back on the ground where people could measure it and so forth yeah um, and it was then taken off again so it's like eh. oh yeah and on a off thing. Okay. Well, yeah, that's rather unfortunate. I hope that can be put available. Um, last question currently uh, from our comment section is uh, Brendan Lee again. And, oh, I've never heard of this dinosaur before, but I'll try my best to pronounce it. He asked if it's uh, Vertipura Aristosaurus. Uh, if, if one of you guys can chime in and help okay. pronounce it. Um, I've never heard of it before. I've uh, never heard of it either, actually. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, Veru Pristosaurus. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, it says, ask, is it really the ancestor of Carcharodontosaurus? Yeah. And the yeah, technical that, the that is, we can't say it actually is the ancestor. Because to say it, an ancestor is a very specific thing. Yeah, yeah. An ancestor is a member of a population whose genes are still in you. Yeah. So your great great grandfather is an ancestor, but your great great grand uncle is not. You're right, yeah. So that's why we try to avoid making that specific statement. Yeah. It does, that said, there's very little material to it, but it does seem to be a late Jurassic Carcharodontosaurid. So in that context, it does seem to be one of the oldest representatives of the lineage that contains Carcharodontosaurids. Yeah. Whether, whether this particular genus is actually the direct ancestor to the genus Carcharodontosaurus is not something we can we can demonstrate right now. Yeah, I have a feeling that Brendan's question is more about if it's like, as you just stated, directly related to the right. Carcharodontosauridae. I, I don't know what his intention was exactly, but my feeling is instead of saying direct ancestor, I feel like he means like ancestry. Like, is it right? Like a and that, yeah. In that context, it does seem to be. There's not very much of it. Yeah, of course. It seem to be consistent with it being an early representative of the Carcharodontosaurids. And it would make sense, because if Carcharodontosauridae, if Carcharodontosauria is the sister group to Allosauridae, which it looks like it is, then we would have to have a member of the Carcharodontosaur line by the point we actually have Allosaurus. Because if they have a common ancestor and we have Allosaurus already present, then the lineage that contains their sister group has to be present too. Yeah, so of course. It's at the right time to be a really primitive Carcharodontosaurid. Yeah, that that um, explanation does make a lot of uh, sense in, into that. That that would be the I I'd assume that'd be the uh, the answer, and that's a good answer or speculation. Um, right. I'm just trying to see. I'm I'm picking another question from Brendan again. Um, oh, all right. You can pick two if you have one you want to share. Some of these are sort of been answered in the degree, but, you know, we can answer them. Or ask them, I should say. Um, I was hoping to get Jeremy's wrapped up, because he had some very good questions. Okay, yeah, let me, um, I, I can read them off if 
you don't mind. I've got them all. I've got them all there. I have them here too. One. I'll pick one if you oh, like. Yeah, you can you can ask one. All right. His third question is: Is there evidence for parental care in some of the large theropod dinosaurs, such as Carnosaurus, Abelosaurus, or Tyrannosaurus? Um. Well, it's the same sort of general evidence that we have. Um. For um. Uh, parental care in other large dinosaurs, and that's mostly phylogenetic. So, um, the living crocodilians and living birds, by and large, have parental care of the young for at least several weeks. And so that seems to be a general archosaurian trait. And so if the common ancestor of archosaurs had that, you would inherit that trait unless you evolve, if you've evolved to lost, like say a cuckoo bird does. Um, so on that level, our expectation, the default expectation, is large theropods would have had parental care. Sadly, we don't have much in the way of good nest sites for big theropods, and it's in particular with associations of adults. So we don't have the direct evidence for that. But on the flip side, we do have these multiple occasions in Tyrannosaurids and in Carcharodontosaurids where multiple growth stages were found buried together with each other. So they died together, and they could, therefore, at least some of the time, live together. Well, if these are family groups, then that presumably uh, points to them having family groups that extend all the way back to the beginning of family, so uh, the babies. Um, so it is mostly circumstantial evidence, but it is consistent with the phylogeny and what limited uh, evidence we have of group activity in Tyrannosaurids, that they, and, and Carcharodontosaurids, and presumably Abelisaurids too, would have had some form of parental care. Interesting. That's my, that's my thoughts exactly. Mm. All right, fourth question. This is a more of an obscure one that Jerry had. He says he's heard of some Siberian Tyrannosaurids referred to as Moshka. Any idea what they might be or are closely related to? Oh, well, there are hmm. there are uh, bits and pieces of tyrannosaurids that have been found in in Siberia. There's there's some sites in Siberia and then right over the border in the northern parts of northeastern China um, from the Maastrichtian, where there's a lot of good a lot of good hadrosaur material and a little bit of um, material of other dinosaurs, including Tyrannosaurus. Now, nothing yet so far has been complete enough to describe as a new species, or even to really give too much detail of the anatomy. Um, so, I think people giving a nickname to them is a little, <laughs> a little premature, but at least they're not giving it a, a formal taxon name. Um, but maybe something uh, is we'll see the light of day, um, and um, certainly that's what we expect to find there, is, uh, is Tyrannosaurids, because we have them further south in Mongolia, and in China at that time, we've got them in Western North America, so they're going to be there in Siberia, too. Gotcha, yeah, I want to... The last question oh. was uh, quite interesting, to say the least. Yeah. The, the, the question said, the question that he asked is, I found Maastrichtian stage fossils just rounded chewed up fragments with theropod beings with punctures matching the diameter of an Albertosaur tooth I have from Massachusetts. And it made me wonder if there was any point when Appalachia and Laramidia were connected during the Cretaceous and had a faunal interchange. Well, um, to the answer to the last part, uh, yes, by the end of the Maastrichtian, uh, the Western Interior Seaway has largely drained away, so there would have been the potential for a faunal interchange, even if we don't have the direct evidence for it yet. Um, that said, we already had over on this side, or we had, we definitely know of at this side of North America, on Eastern North America, in the Maastrichtian, we have Dryptosaurus, so a non Tyrannosaurid, Tyrannosauroid, um, whose teeth are not dissimilar to Albertosaurus. So uh, the puncture marks 
could be from an Albertosaur, but they should also look at the possibility it's from a Dryptosaur that we already know what we're over here. Uh, all that said, I will be totally unsurprised when the first Triceratops or T-Rex tooth shows up in the latest Cretaceous uh, of New Jersey or something like that, because all the evidence suggests that the la there is direct land-to-land -land connection by that end at the time Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus are around. So there's nothing that should be stopping them from getting over here. We just haven't seen the, de the definite evidence for it yet. Yeah, yeah good uh, explained answer. Um, before we get on to some of the other viewers' questions, I want to ask uh -huh. some of mine. I have two sure. questions I want to ask. <laughs> This first one will be a little bit uh, controversial, I think. Uh, what are your What are your general views on Awesome Bro culture? Um, uh. I'm interested, I'm interested to hear about that because I've never actually heard of a paleontologist actually talking about the. I mean, they're aware of it, but I've never heard any th thoughts about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say, on the one hand, the heart is in the right place. <laughs> To, uh, to say, well, nature is cool. And that's good. And, you know, if, if it takes the rootinous, tootinous, fighting dinosaurs to get the attention to begin with, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But you got to move on beyond that. There's more yeah. to animals than uh, their size or how strong they could fight or whatever. And those are good things. Those are good things to be interested in. But use them as your stepping stone. Use yeah. them as the way to start and start exploring the rest of the animals. Uh, that they did more than that. That they want to look into to more of them. And be willing to be interested in what the real creature was like and not your opinion of it. So True. when new discoveries come along... Be happy about the new discoveries and try to understand them. Don't say that science is ruining your creatures. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're not your creatures. There are. Yes. <laughs> they're, they're, they're their own thing. They are nature's yeah. creatures, and we just want to understand them. You know, I don't think you could put it any more nicer than that, to be honest. Um, okay, thanks. Check yeah. Check the comments section and some of the groups I've been in. They've gotten quite oh. nasty. Yeah. Wow. I, I, hope, I hope with what you just said, you don't get any hate now from from that but I'm again you sure, did you... you know the, the, the hate mail will be treated with exactly the amount of respect it deserves yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you'll you'll you'll, you'll uh, treat it with the same respect as you answer the question so okay. yeah. yeah um and then my second question is kind of similar to what Christopher asked about your field stuff and that's uh do you have any plans on doing any further research um Necessarily, you don't have to talk about what it is if it's especially sure. confidential. Oh, but if yeah, you have any yeah. plans to, you know, either write any papers of your own or co-author on, you know, co-write on a paper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. In fact, um, the, I was on. I presented. Well, I was presented one paper last SVP meeting and was second author on the one right afterwards. Both of them having to do with different aspects of locomotion and theropods. Okay. And we're definitely continuing uh, both those as, as further papers. Um, and then I've got other stuff that I've been sitting around and have to work on yeah. Um, yeah. to get into published forms. And then plus there are some um, – there's a kid's book that I'm just wrapping up. Interesting. Uh, hopefully by the, by the next week or so we'll get the last – the final draft – those are the – first draft of the last chapter so that every chapter will at least have like one draft to start getting that through the pipeline. Uh, and then once that's done, in terms of the pop culture things, the next step is to go and do the revision of the Big Green Book. So, mm -hmm. Dinosaurs will be the more up-to-date uh, yeah. guide to... We we'll probably won't change the title, but maybe we will. But gotcha. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. The Big Green Book. Well, I'll have to look out for that kind of stuff. It sounds like mm -hmm. uh, some really interesting, interesting things. Um... Greg, do you want to read off some um, other questions from like um, from Brendan and uh, is it John, I think, or or Larry? Uh, do you want to read Larry. some more? Because I, I I've been kind of hogging up all the questions here. Questions. Okay, sure. All right. His first, his very first one was: Has anybody done studies to determine if a feathered down adult T-Rex could shed enough excess heat due to the volume volume to surface area ratios? 
to my knowledge, no one has done that study, but an aspect of feathers that people don't often uh, remember is that they're actually, they have sort of roots going down into the skin where the muscles can pull on it, and they can extend them outward or bring them back plus birds can, so presumably the state could do this as well. Uh, so whether you want to dump heat or trap heat, so um, they're not strictly a passive structure, they're actually actively moved so that when birds need to dump heat, they can. Um, also, we don't know enough, I don't think, there's, I would expect, my expectation, if, if someone were to say, you know, what do you think is most likely? The most likely thing is that a, in a fully adult Tyrannosaurus is not going to be entirely covered with feathers, but there's going to be big, big patches of it which are exposed um, so that, uh, you know, maybe when they're younger, they're going to be more feathery and they lose them as they get older, but we don't have direct evidence for that yet. That said, and given that said, you know, Eutyrannus is about 1.4 tons and is covered with 20 centimeter long fuzz. So certainly you can get away with being a big animal that's covered with a lot of fuzz. Um, I want to ask a question to follow up on that. Um, how do you, it's kind of a pop culture related sure. question. So how, if you've seen the depiction of uh, the video game Saurian and their uh, depiction of T-Rex, do you consider that with whatever evidence we have about feathered Tyrannosaurids? Would you consider that to be accurate? Because what you just said about it being not completely covered uh, matches that description, so that's what kind of came to mind. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they have a very reasonable reconstruction. Now, to be fair, you know, uh, there were times when they they occasionally did consult with me, although not, you know, a lot of it is stuff they did themselves. Yeah, of uh, course. But, um, um, so, um, but yeah, yeah, I think there that is one quite reasonable interpretation. We, we unfortunately don't have the direct evidence to say more or less than what they showed, but it is consistent with what we know. Yeah, so I, I thought, again, your description of what you might consider to be feathered matches that of the Saurian one, so that kind of came to mind, and right, I wanted yeah. to ask about that, so I guess we'll just kind of continue down from this, uh, this list here, uh, if you want to continue, Greg. Okay, number two, uh, Larry says, I've seen population studies too high to be a... S okay, I'm reading the phrases. <laughs> I've seen population studies that put the T-Rex population too high to be a strict predator. Is this fossilization bias, or is there something else that explains this? Um, yeah, the, um... The... We know very little, um, in terms of how what we find at a single horizon or multiple horizons actually reflect the living populations that existed over the space of a year at one spot. Uh, because fossils are not, much as we want them to be, they're not being continuously generated at the same rate, and so sampling is always a big issue. Um, so. Also, however, given given saying that meat is meat, so if people are saying that there's the population is too high for them to be predators, they're actually also saying it's too high for them to be scavengers, and they therefore have to be herbivores. Um, because it doesn't matter whether you kill the animal yourself or if something else kills it for you. The trophic pyramid isn't based on how the food is prepared. It's, it's based on how the energy is coming into the system. So if there are people who are arguing the population is too high to be predators, they're also arguing it's too high for them to be scavengers. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. All right, that is Larry's last question. In the news a while back, there was a fight of two small pterosaurids in association with a ceratopsian dinosaur. These were thrown off the radar. Any progress in studying this find? Ye you know, I heard rumors about this. I don't. When you hear a lot of rumors, and a lot of them turn out not to be true, I wouldn't, for instance, I wouldn't be surprised if this was an early rumor about the dueling dinosaur specimen, which of course turns out to be just one theropod. You know, when you're out in the field, you don't have the stuff prepared, and and you misinterpret stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, 
for, and additionally, for it's the, the dueling dinosaur specimen, for a long time they were saying, oh, this is an entirely new ceratopsian, and until they said, oh, no, it's a triceratops. So when you, when you see stuff early on, you might make conclusions that as you get more information, you have to change your mind about. Yeah, that's a good explanation. I Cam, I, Cam posted a, <laughs> a really good question <laughs> that actually... Oh. Uh, is in, I think is pretty funny. He's wondering about your how mad you were about the uh, the Hell Creek Spinosaurus, the Montana Spinus. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just chuckling at it. I think this is the funniest question we've gotten. Yeah, and now, I, I was I got really mad at, about it. Um, although to be fair, there were other personal family issues going on at the time that caused me to react more publicly and strongly than I might have otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I did apologize to the guys. After I think I saw that, yeah. They understood. They understood. Yeah, I, I saw that post in question. Yeah, that said, I had been warning them since they first suggested that, and I told them, people are not going to understand. Yeah. That, that it is not... When you do a parody thing, to make it an effective parody, it has to be really unreasonably stupid. Yeah. Like the famous one was the Discover Magazine talked about the ice borers, which were supposed to be, you know, these moles with heat generating organs on their head that poured through the ice. And <laughs> even that wasn't, the, and they used a picture, they, they, they sort of photoshopped an image of a, um, uh, taken mold rats and gave them this oh heat organ on their head. Uh, and put all these clues in the article, like the scientist who changed it was Aprile Pazu, which is apparently April Fools in uh, oh uh, in Italian. Um, that said, people took it seriously. Yeah. Because uh, they thought, you know, this is a trusted news source. Um, and. Um, and as we've seen, you know, in a much broader context more recently, this whole idea of fake news is a lot of people don't have the savvy to really tell the distinction between real news and fake news, whether it's about dinosaurs or whether it's about anything. Um, and so it can be fun to do something like that, but then those of us who do scientific outreach have to for years and years to come explain no it was a hoax yeah they were just having fun and then we'll have to do that again the next year when the next person comes along with oh, it oh god so yeah. um yeah that, that's sort of why i was really upset about that no of course you know i i think as you said people it has to be like people understand the parody or has to be really stupid and i think with the general public you know compared to people like us, you know, who kind of know these things a little bit better. They, as you said, they, they, they wouldn't know the difference, especially if it's coming from what they believe is a reliable source. So I think it's an ineffective parody, right. to say the least. And especially, it's just, reason, it's just plausible enough to be true, because we do have Campanian Asian Spinosaurid material. Not much, but yeah. a little bit. The, the youngest occurring spinosaurids are from are from China. So oh. it wouldn't be super crazy just to have 10 to 15 million years later those guys over in, in North America. Zero yeah. evidence for it, but it's, it's just, it's not like having a trilobite, a giant land trilobite in the Hell Creek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I, I totally yeah. understand. Okay, yeah. That's interesting. Greg, do you want to answer or ask your question, or how are we... We had Brendan's final set of questions to get answered. Gotcha. I'll, I'll read them off then. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to read his final question. Uh, he says, how long exactly, exactly and precisely is the radiation of Carnosauria from Sinoraptor all the way to Taurovenator? I think that's how you say it. Uh, yeah, well that's... The problem is, um, the earliest carnosaurs, um, there are bits and pieces from the early part of the mid 
Jurassic, which might be from Carnosauria. Um, and then the youngest would be something like Tauravenator, or if the Megaraptorids are, are carnosaurs or not. So, um, so we're going there from the Middle Jurassic, so say 175 billion years ago, to things in about 70 million years or so. So, you know, they're around for 100 billion years or more, uh, which is a pretty long run. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, um, you know, towards the end, they weren't the, the big game, the big guys in town, but they're still, they're still about yeah. in, in some form or another. But yeah, so they're around for quite a long period of time. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, I think that's his final question, so you can probably ask your questions now, Greg. Okay, Brandon actually did have two other ones. Oh, uh, okay. Before that, all right. His part one is: Will we ever find more large basal tyrannosaurs in Lake Cretaceous deposits similar to Utahiranus and Dryptosaurus? I hope so. <laughs> I, I can't say whether we are going to or not, but I think I hope so. I would, I would certainly say, but the existence of Dryptosaurus um, does point to um, to the fact that there are large-bodied. Uh, non-tyrannosaurid tyrannosauroids around at that time so certainly they're they're out there and hopefully we will find them you can only hope okay. yeah and, and the last question was he was he was asking about the diet of siad Gulaccio, glicho and australvenator okay um well i'll do the one that's the easiest to answer first so um Gualicho, we don't know we don't have a head we don't even know it's a carnivore. Um, so there's the non-zero chance that that Bahariasaurids, which looks like is going to be the actual group to which they belong. Gotcha. Um, um, we don't know that they were necessarily carnivorous because at least some of the data puts them actually closer to things like Laphrosaurus and, um, and Lemusaurus, which are edentulous well, at least Lemosaurus is a dentalist as an adult. Um, so without a head, and without a head of any close relative, so, you know, Gualicho and Deltadromius and Bahariasaurus and uh, Aeonoraptor, we don't have heads on any of them. So we have no idea if they were necessarily carnivores. Uh, Seahawks, um, its formation is better known. And there are a bunch of ankylosaurs and sauropods and small-bodied ornithopods around for it to eat. And in the case of Australovenator, similarly, there's ankylosaurs and sauropods and um, ornithopods of various sorts um, around for it to eat. So um, they actually, despite the fact they're on opposite ends of the world, had sort of similar diets because that sort of mid-Cretaceous faunal assemblage is pretty similar in many spots. Gotcha. Okay. And I found I pulled two more questions from the questions we had asked Dinosaur George. Mm. First one is, what is the worst injury you've seen in any prehistoric animal that you either seen personally or in a uh, photograph or something? Oh wow, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> uh, worst injury. Let's see. Well, I, I don't know that it's, it's hard to quantify worse, but I can think of some really bad ones. So the type specimen of Archelon, which I've seen, is at the Peabody Museum, so the giant sea turtle, it's, let me get this right, it's right hind leg, if I remember correctly, was bitten off. Oof. So it only had three flippers, Ouch. and the right hind leg had been bitten off probably by like Tylosaurus. Most likely, the yeah. The or a big flyosaur. That's not good. No. <laughs> um, um, the Smithsonian specimen of Allosaurus uh, is seriously injured. So its upper jaw, the front end was smashed in, it, it had lost its teeth, it was warped, uh, it is a, its, its scapula was shattered, it regrew at the wrong angle, oh, and this new yeah. callus came out that looked kind of like the uh, lower part of Michigan, looks sort of like a mitten. <laughs> um, and, and its ribs along that side were also shattered. So that was a seriously bad injury, but it's one it lived through. For that matter, um, Big Al 
uh, mm, also yeah. had a bunch of serious injuries on it uh, in its hind limb and so forth. Um, so those are three Mesozoic reptile specimens I can think of with some really serious injuries. You know, I've seen some really big growths and calluses and, and so forth as well, but those are the ones that are specific ones that come to mind. Gotcha. Or what about that poor allosaurus that had this thagomizer stuck in his crotch? Oh, oh, that yes. too. Oh, that said, too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the one with the thagomizer in his pubis, another one has a thagomizer spike in its tail. Oh, God, uh, yeah. Or the puncture wound in its tail. Yeah, that's pretty serious, so. Oh, God, yeah. I, I was going to follow up with kind of two questions. Is the allosaur from the Smithsonian you're referring to, is that the one that like they used in uh, the dinosaur revolution one with the with the jaw being snapped is that the same one yeah, you're referring to that's the, ins that's the inspiration for it but the yeah. one in dinosaur revolution got clobbered even worse uh than uh the actual and one some ways got clobbered worse than the than the smithsonian one however it managed to heal in such a way that it still had teeth at the front of its jaw oh gotcha the, uh, the, of the one side whereas the poor smithsonian one lost all its teeth Gotcha. And then I, another one that comes to mind, I was thinking when seeing this question, was also, you know, the one from Dinosaur Revolution with the T-Rex uh, humerus, I think that, you know, I, I think the humerus was, was it, was, was got ripped off, or, or like, you know, the the, the, the lower uh, forearm got, you right. know, bitten off, and then like, I think the upper part, or the uh, proximal part of the humerus remained, but you know, the, the distal part of the humerus and the rest of the forearm got you know, ripped apart. Is that? Yeah. That's that's and, one that comes um, to mind. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, there definitely are, and that you know, though that's a, a it's an isolated specimen, uh, rather than part of an articulated skeleton, but it was the inspiration for it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there certainly are specimens that are have been seriously, uh, seriously damaged. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Got a couple more okay. questions. All right. right, this one is the one. The one we also asked George. If you could just, if you could spend the rest of your life just studying one specimen, what would it be? Ooh. It would have to be one that hasn't been found yet. Ooh. <laughs> um. Good choice. So there are um. There are tar sands from Canada. Uh, that have produced a really, really complete um, notosaur. That's there's pictures of it around on the internet, but it hasn't been officially named yet. People are, are in the midst of studying it. So the specimen I would want to study would be the complete tyrannosaurid found in that sort of same situation that also managed to preserve soft tissue. Because um, if you're going to study something that long, you might as well get some soft tissue with it too. Might as well, yeah. So yeah, yeah but. Um, that would be the one. <laughs> That's a good choice. Agreed. And this was a question I had asked you earlier. Who are your favorite paleo artists past and present? And from this, what is your all-time favorite paleo art piece? Ah. Well, I can answer that last one first. Um, my all-time fa favorite paleo art piece is a Greg Paul piece. It's a painting of two Tyrannosaurus running away from the painter's point of view. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Classic. Yeah. As for favorite paleo artists, I, there's just so many of them that I really like, and particularly being someone who can barely draw a straight line, I have great <laughs> respect for them. Yeah. Um, that, uh, it's, you know, I don't want to miss some, but I'm sure I will. So, you know, I would say, obviously, I've worked with a bunch of paleo artists that I really like. So, Mike Skrepnik and uh, Bob Walters and Louis Ray, of course. Um, uh, and uh, John Gurchy and um, let's see uh, Julius Sistoni um, let's see um, there's uh, this Gabrielle N.U. and I'm not certain their actual last name but they signed that way on, on Twitter who's a really good new artist out there um, there's Oh wow! Um, Doug Henderson. Yeah, yeah, Doug Henderson. Uh, 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 Doug Henderson. Um, there's uh, well, Greg Paul, obviously. Yeah. Um, there's Hallett. Um, yeah. There's Conway. Conway, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Raven Amos. Um, 
Let's see. Um, Mark Witten, by any chance? Mark yeah, Witten. Uh, uh, and Raul Witten. Martin. What's that? Raul Martin. Raul, Raul Martin. Uh, oh, wow. Um, just scanning now over here, trying to take a look at the books on the wall here. Um, there is... Oh, it's got a Russian last name. Uh, it's done a lot of more mammals than, than dinosaurs. Uh, well, there's, uh, oh, there's Autogen, who's done a lot of dinosaurs. And then... Uh, not Salazar. Samal... Uh, there's a recent... I don't... Yeah. A, a recent book on South American mammals, where oh, Melanar is his name. Fel, yes, Simon uh, Hotsky. That's it. Yeah, does phenomenal work with, particularly with some creatures that people otherwise haven't dealt with as much. Um, let's see. I know I've got to be forgetting a bunch of others. Can't forget but, well, uh, Emily uh, Willoughby for sure. She's one of the most fantastic ones. Oh yeah, Emily Willoughby, wonderful. Um, um, uh, Daniel Defoe, uh, um, with, uh, uh, her particularly, uh, sort of detailed anatomical drawings. Um, oh, the name is escaping me, but the artist who helped illustrate the, uh, quadrupedal launch does really good technical illustrations. Um, there's just so many of them out there. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. I apologize to those whose <laughs> names that I just totally spaced on. Uh, Nichols. Yeah, oh, yep, yeah. Hey, he's a good yeah, one, too. Yeah, uh, Dan Varner, um, um, yeah, and it's just, there's this huge community now of people who are bringing fossil creatures to life in a way that, you know, we scientists can't do, uh, because it's a much more immediate way of interacting with them. Yes. Um, um, and the tradition goes all the way back. I mean, because you go back to Georges Cuvier, you know, so the first guy to really recognize that they were, that fossils represented the remains of ancient creatures, some of the, he did really, especially for his time, really competent illustrations of his fossil mammals. Uh, and he knew that he needed to do that to get people understanding that these bits and pieces of bone were parts of living creatures and that they looked different than anything alive today. Yeah, one thing I was going to note too is that I feel like definitely a lot of younger people, you know, my age and kind of the, the millennial group, a lot of the careers I think in paleo are a paleo artist. Um, you know, a lot of younger mm. people are definitely choosing paleo art as their, you know, topic of, of jobs. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw a, a shout out to one of my really good friends. His name's uh, Fair Knock. He's uh, kind of an up and coming mm. paleo artist. He's like, he probably like, you know, one of hundreds of paleo artists, but he's done commissions for me before. Uh, I shared it with Sam and Greg on the uh, on our discussion here. And you know, I wish this I wish this was a visual podcast to where I could actually present his work. Um, but sure. he's he's fantastic. I might have to send you some of his uh, his pictures, but I have to just give a shout out to him and then, you know, uh, Mark Witten, Julius Castoni, uh, John Conway Emily Willenby, John Gurch, you know, the, the list is long for me as well, but right. I can agree with those as well. Dave but... Kretz, um, and yes. especially, you know, yeah, working in not just 2D, but 3D, um, which is its own challenge. Uh, and special shout out Gary Staub. Oh, yeah, oh, sure. and oh, too. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yes. of course. Special shout out to Gary. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. His models, I just can't the quality of his model reconstructions. Yes. Yeah. And working in sometimes in, you know, one-to-one -one size in some cases, in one-to-one -one scale, um, which is, you know, even more challenging. Um, oh, um, God, name's gonna forget. The other Tyler. Um, not Leeson. Um, um, is he also a paleo artist? He's a paleo artist, does sculpture, uh, did the sculpture of the face of Jane and of, um, and of Dryptosaurus, um, and was arguing for dino lips, actually. Um, oh, I think I might and, know who you're talking about, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> 
dinosaur sculpture. Um, do, 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 do. I just thought of another name, Dear John Tyler, Civic. Sir. What's his name? Yes. John Tyler. Civic. Oh, and of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, classic. Um, so, um, um, yeah, there's so many of them. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a, a huge field. We could, um, we could definitely spend like an hour or more just talking about yeah, all the, d the talented ones that are around. But yeah, I think we've hit kind of the highlighted, highlighted ones that we know of, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Nothing about the classics, you know. Yeah. Oh, Charles Knight. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Jet Nick Bob Salinger. Yeah. Was it, I think it was Rudy. Rudy Salinger. Rudy Salinger, yeah, yeah. Even Bob Bacher does some good, uh, or at least oh, does, yeah. yeah, you know, does some good drawings well, he's, as well. He's not bad. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sam's going to be calling it a day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, All right. Yeah. I, well, thank you for your time, Tom. I really enjoyed it. Sure course yeah it was fun so um i hope the people out there enjoyed us so uh um and uh yeah so um yeah and i don't know if you've had many paleo artists on but that would be a good thing at some point to do and maybe talk about you know technique and so forth so yeah i think greg plan to have somebody on there the last artist we had on was joe devito oh, okay i think i've heard of them yeah the author of Kong, King of Skull Island. Oh yeah, I, I, I remember you, you talking about that um, on one of the, one of your posts. But yeah, I hope. But I, I saw the poll, you know, where you asked who you wanted on the show, and you know, obviously with Thomas being like the one that right. was on well, on by a long shot. You know, yeah. there there he were others the, that you won, posted. He won the popular vote. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I hope you feel. I hope you feel proud. <laughs> yes. yes um, I, was, I was very pleased about that. Yeah, you know, I, I think inviting other paleo artists, you know, some that you threw in, Greg, and, you know, I threw in a couple that, you know, probably would be nice to get interviewed. So I, I think that was a good idea to interview some more paleo artists. Um, yeah, I think that'd be a good, mm -hmm. good thing. Well, have a good night, Tom. I really enjoyed it. Great. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, so sorry to be hanging up now, but it's getting close to dinner time for me. It's all good. Yeah, yeah you're fine. Yep. Yeah. Well, I was glad to be able to do this. And Happy New Year, everyone. Of course. Thank you, Thank you too, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Okay, take care. Take care. Till next, till next time. Yep. Yeah.